Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce a couple people before we get rolling. I got Alejandro over here in the back. And then I have Ben over there. So there, we're going to change things up a little bit. How many people have been to a, just a standalone Gorilla Mindset seminar? I, one, two, three. Yeah, so a few of you have. Not most of you, actually. So I, I feel bad. I, ch I changed a bunch of material because I didn't want to repeat to people, but now we have a new audience. But anyway, I brought in Alejandro. We're going to talk about posture, movement, some physical movements, but it isn't going to be too crazy. And then I'm going to talk to Ben, who's going to talk about charisma. So the first half will be the Gorilla Mindset kind of model of the book. And then the second half of it, we'll take a short break, and then the second half of the seminar is going to be posture and charisma and everything. So the way we always like to get going, and this is my first time doing a slideshow, is we always go with, you know, what is mindset? So you know, I'll write you in the blue shirt. What is mindset? Okay, what do you say? Okay, so you, okay, you got the, def uh, Dr. Jane Ruby, what do you say? Oh, um, it's the, it's the way you're thinking. Okay. Uh, how you keep track of your thoughts. Okay. So I'll give you the official dictionary definition, which is a set of assumptions, methods, or notations held by one or more people that are so well established that creates a powerful incentive within those people or groups to continue to adapt or accept prior behaviors or choices. In a way, uh, mindset is your culture, but within yourself. So if you ever take your cultural anthropology 101, they'll say, well, what is culture? They'll say ABVs, right? Attitudes, beliefs, and values that are shared collectively by a, a group of people or a country or a subculture. That's how you define a culture. Well, ultimately, that's the same thing that mindset is. It's a set of assumptions, methods, or notations held by one or more people. So, a classic example I always give is that you can view the world as one of scarcity or abundance. That is the fundamental way that you can view the world. And a lot of people, and once you understand this, by the way, you'll see how a lot of people interact with the world. For example, cheap people view the world generally as one of scarcity. Well, how, you know, how do I cut corners here? And then not only are they like, not tipping well, and being cheap about everything, but that same value that the world is scarce, they cheat everybody. So then if you go into business with them, they're going to cheat you. If there's a business opportunity, they won't take it because it's going to be too much risk. That's because fundamentally they have a belief that the world is one of scarcity. And then the, if, so if you believe that, that the world is scarce, then everything you do is going to be limited. And whereas my fundamental mindset belief is one of abundance and overwhelming opportunity. That's why when people go, well, what are your goals, or how do you do what you do, or how do you do this? And I go, I just don't really actually know. All I know is that I, I tune in and I resonate, and I just look at the world of one of opportunity. I look at people as a way to connect in one of opportunity. And then once you change that fundamental mindset and, mindset and you no longer view the world as closed off, then opportunity does present themselves, and you see opportunities you wouldn't already see, and you enter places you um, maybe wouldn't otherwise go. I mean, I've taken a lot of you know, people who try to study kind of like my story arc. Like, well, how did you end up over here? What you're doing today versus where I was. And I go, I have, have no idea. I just viewed it as a new kind of opportunity, a new challenge, a new growth. So that is, and, th and then that is going to change how everything you do. What if you just said, for example, I'm open to possibilities, right? What if you just woke up every day and you said, I'm open to possibilities. I'm open to what might happen today. And you're interacting with the world as being an open place. Well, you're going to be less fearful, right? Because if you view it as scarce, you also view people as kind of trying to, you know, out to get you. So if you, if you have an open attitude, an open mindset, and you view the world as presenting kind of endless opportunities, which I mean, honestly, it does. You know, economic, in like the next three to five years, I'm very concerned about the direction of the West and the U.S. especially. But we're right now in another golden age that most people don't realize. I think the age we're in now is going to be looked back on in the ways that the Roaring Twenties are looked back on before the Great Depression. But then there are people who are like, well, I don't know, I'm depressed. Like, you can learn anything. Anything that you want, you can come to a mindset seminar and you learned about me through uh, an, an online app, right? I'm talking to a, a telephone. 
all day. I looked like crazy, you know, Shauna's parents. I was living with them for the summer, and her mom was like, what is, what is Michael doing? He's just sitting down there. He has a tripod, and he's, he's talking, right? It, 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 seems a little, it seems a little goofy, and it's, it's, yeah, and it is, right? And it is. You're, you're sitting out there, but if you view it as, wow, that, that camera phone is an opportunity to connect with the world and to talk to you know, millions of people around the world so some people could view their, their camera or their phone, uh, they view it differently. That's why, too, when, when um, you know, journalists or whatever come to my house and you know, try to study what I do, they no longer, their conspiracy theories about like Russian robots in every, it ends right away because they just didn't have any idea. No, it, it's just a com computer and a phone is a portal to the world if that's how you view the opportunity. Where, so people in media are saying, oh my God, it's the worst time to be a journalist. You can't make a living, can't do this. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? This is the golden age of doing what I'm doing. So if you read the conventional wisdom, they'll say MTV has fired people, Vice has fired people. This is bad, this is the worst time in the world to be a journalism major. Well, I, I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I think that's fake news. I would say, it's Saturday morning and you have a journalism degree, why aren't you walking down every, just asking people questions. Hey, who'd you vote for? Who do you like, who do you don't like? What do you think about this issue? Because that's the way I see the world. I just walk, that's how I'm able to predict things other people can is I'm an Uber driver or, or an Uber car and I don't think, oh, this guy's just my driver. Right, because that's how these people, that's how they're treated. You know how it is, I've been in the service industry. I think, well, this is amazing. I'm sitting down here and I'm gonna talk to somebody who's gonna have a different view of the world, maybe from another country, maybe he's new. A lot of people I learned through Uber, they had you know, maybe like a good pension job at UPS, they lose that. Well, what, what are the economic concerns this person has? What are they thinking about the world? What are they thinking about the news coverage? What, so all throughout the election, I would just talk to every Uber driver because I viewed that as an opportunity for me, right? Because that's the way I view the world is openness, opportunity, abundance. Now, if you're a snob or whatever, you're going to say, or you have a scarcity mindset, you're going to say, well, what does that guy have to tell me? What does the janitor have to tell me? What does the, the, just the regular working guy or working girl ha have to tell me? That's the way most people in media view it as well as people don't know anything. I you know, went to college and everything. Well, they have a scarcity mindset. They think that knowledge is limited. They think that an understanding of the world is limited, and largely it's limited to them in their little subculture, in their little bubble, whereas me, it's just it's a human condition, right? Because throughout my travels, I mean, I've had, what, actually one of the funnier moments I had was, I'm not gonna get, get too specific because I'll out the person, but I, I was having dinner with a very, you know, successful person that everybody in here would know who it was, and then after dinner, I was like, oh, you know, do you have any espresso or whatever? And they're like, well, we'll try to make one. And I thought, man, this guy doesn't even know how to make good coffee. You know, this is, <laughs> how, how do they not even know that, right? And, and that's the way I've always viewed the world is how do I kind of figure things out and be open to new knowledge and open to new experiences? And that is fundamentally what your mindset is. So you, as you see, I just spent like five minutes on that, which seems like a small point. But that's what mindset is. You make tiny little shifts every time. So if all you, if all you left with was a mantra, which is that I'm, I'm open to possibilities, I'm open to explore what the world has to offer, your relationship with the world is going to change fundamentally. If, for example, whenever I travel, you know, I'd go to like Thailand, people are like, oh my God, you're going to Thailand? Must be so dangerous. And I thought, well, actually, it's way more safe than the U.S. You can, right, you've, you've obviously never been, but... They view the world as kind of scary, where even I might, even if it were dangerous, which it's not, I would say, well, that's amazing. I'm going to be in a dangerous situation, and that is going to give me an opportunity to learn what it feels like to be in danger, to learn what it feels like to fear for my safety, to learn what it takes to get out of a, a desperate situation and to figure things out. So in, in my view, then you could take a dangerous situation and you can turn it into an opportunity. So if, if that's all anybody ever leaves with with this stuff is, I'm open to the universe and all of its possibilities, which is what I say every day. I'm just, I'm open to the universe and all of its possibilities. You have, actually, you'll have more opportunity. So people think that we live in a scarce time and it's trying times. That's why you never hear this from me, is even when I get political or media, you never hear from me, the economy could crash tomorrow, it's terrible. You never, you never hear any of that from me. Now you might in a couple years. But right, right, it might change. 
the next three to f I'm worried about what's going to happen in maybe three years from now or five years from now. But you'll never hear that from me now because there's, there's so much opportunity that we've never had in all of our lives. So if you change that and you say, I'm open to the world and all of its possibilities, I'm open to people, I'm open to communications, I'm open to connections. And that's why you'll see the second half we talk about charisma and connection. Because if you're open to the world and possibilities, that means you're open to people and possibilities. And if you meet people and you're not open to possibilities, how are you going to persuade them? How are they going to find you to be a leader? How are they going to find you charismatic? If you're closed off or you view them as nothing more than a hired help or something like that. So it all starts here. It all starts with mindset. And that's why it's just very simple. If you change your mindset at this fundamental level, your whole life opens up. And it opens up, again, it opens up in ways I don't even know. What I do, people tell me, you know, what do you do for a living? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> so then what is gorilla mindset and what's the difference? So Carol Dweck or Dweck or however you say her name, she wrote a book, Mindset. And it's one of those like pop social psychology books, which is that there's two types of mindset, growth versus fixed. And if you teach students that their intelligence is fixed, their capabilities are fact fixed, then they're going to quit because they think, well, I gave it my best shot and it didn't work, and that's just the way it is. I don't have that talent. I don't have what it takes. And we're all that way with math, right? Well, I'm not naturally good at math. Who said that, right? I'm just not good at math. Well, it's like a mindset thing. You don't even realize that you've just said, well, I'm just not good at math. Well, the question is, well, how do you become good at math? Well, you have to study it and practice it, and you might not become naturally good. I'm not naturally an extroverted person. I'm naturally an introverted person. So if I, and this, I even, that was an issue I had to work with three, four years ago. People go, I don't believe you're introverted. Ask Shauna. I don't know where Shauna went. But ask her, after this is done, I'm going to be, I'm going to crash, <laughs> right? I'm not going to talk to anybody tomorrow, probably not even her, and then she's going to be upset. But I, I said fundamentally, well, OK, I'm naturally introverted. You can end it, well, I'm just naturally not that kind of guy. For example, uh, you know, Paul Joseph Watson, very, very uh, amazing person, super high profile, and, and we're hanging out. And I'm with Alex Jones, and I'm like, we're doing like an intervention. We're like, Paul, you got to promote yourself more. you got to shill more. And he's like, well, I'm just not that kind of guy. I'm British. I'm just not. I'm like, you're a pop culture icon. You're the biggest guy right now. You're the hottest star. You're bigger than I'll ever be. And he's like, well, I'm just not that kind of guy, right? And that's the way we define ourselves in certain ways. And of course, he's, he's, he's great. I mean, that's not throwing shade at all, but it's just saying even people who are like really high up sometimes have these mindset beliefs that fundamentally change how they interact with and engage with the world. And then that's going to limit your possibilities, where if you just say, well, you're right, I'm not that kind of guy then how do I become that kind of guy or that kind of girl? And then that's what the model does, is it works you all through the definitions of yourself. We start with self-talk, uh, emotional control. Everything kind of connects. We talk to how you define yourself by your identity. OK, so we're going to go back one, maybe. OK, so the mindset model is this is how everything's connected. If you've read Guerrilla Mindset, you know there's 10 or 11 or 12 chapters, something like that. There's one on self-talk. There's one on framing. There's one on mood or state. There's one on posture, vision, health, fitness, lifestyle. Now, each chapter is separate, but also each chapter is also connected. And that's what I mean by the model is they're all connecting together at the same time and interacting with way, in ways. But it differs for the person. So for example, me, I'm naturally introverted. Who here is naturally introverted? Right. 25% of the population is introverted. 75% of people who read my stuff and come to my stuff are introverts. So we have this um, high, high introvert population. That's why self-talk is, for me, the most valuable mindset tool that I ever learned. If you're an introvert, this is by far the most important. That's why you know, I've been to Tony Robbins seminars. I've been to a lot of these um, events, and I just didn't like it. And that's how a guerrilla mindset is a little bit different. You go in, and they, they wind you up, and you're motivated, and you're hyped or whatever. Or maybe if you've ever been to like a Pentecostal church or something. And then you leave, and then the feeling dissipates, and that's it, right? Like you shook around, and you jumped, and everybody was happy and everything. 
And then you walk away, well, that's more of an extroverted thing. An extrovert and an extrovert how their the body responds to dopamine is going to be different from an introvert. So with an introvert, you constantly have this running conversation in your head. Am I good enough? Am I worthy? Am I this? Am I that? Except the way we talk to ourselves is different. The way we talk to ourselves, well, it's primarily bad, right? I mean, who here felt like they were going to be late this morning? Anybody? All right. Cole, you thought you were going to be late. What, what was running through your head when you thought you were going to be late? Yeah, stand up. Let's hear you. This is good. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, said I, hate this, I hate Santa Monica. I hate start to say about people I don't like to see. I start to say, I ain't fucking people here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm going to be late. I'm going to get a good chair. What were you saying? To, were you judging yourself, though? Exactly. And that, were you saying to yourself, you're always late, Cole? You always do this? Why don't you plan better? I say that I get really excited when I, I'm late. And right. What were you saying, though? What were you saying to yourself, the, the monologue in your head? Okay. Right. And as you're saying that to yourself, what happened to your mood? Oh, it definitely changes. And then as your mood changes for the worse, what happens to the conversation you're having? Uh, it changes. Now right. A vicious cycle. Right, exactly. I hate LA. There's traffic, traffic everywhere. This is stupid. Uh, I'm not going to get a good seat. You know, this is, uh, I'm mad. Right, so you're, that's a conversation you're having with yourself. Thanks, Cole. That's a conversation you're having with yourself, and then that changes your mood. And then your mood gets worse, and then the, when you're in a bad mood, now the things you say to yourself are inherently more negative, right? So you create this feedback cycle, and that's what I mean by, that's why we'll keep re referring to the model in itself, is they're all kind of connected. So for example, too, mindfulness. There was a lack of mindfulness there. Um, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm looking at every red light now. So instead of just being in the moment and present, I'm driving my car, you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna hit another red light, and I, you know, this car is gonna cut in front of me, and, and, and it isn't just cool. I mean, that's the thing is I've never pretended to be better than anybody else because I was screaming in my car like three days ago because I went to bed and I had 26 miles in the gas tank and I had to drive 11 to Irvine and I had a, a media thing going on at 11 a.m. And I'm driving and the media, the, the people who have me on the show, they rent this very expensive studio. So, you know, you need to be on time. I'm driving and then it says eight miles. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to make it 11. So then I turn on my Google Maps, and I'm, and I'm going to turn off. But then Google Maps thought I was still on the freeway, which I didn't know, so it's giving me the wrong directions. Oh. And then I'm, so then I'm on the toll road, and then I get off the toll road, and now I'm like, I'm going to get hit with another toll and my tax dollars, and I'm just working myself up. I'm going to get hit with two tolls now for this ride, and California is just stealing my money. <laughs> They're not doing anything. I'm going to run out of, and I screamed in my car. I go, Mom! So that's fine, right? That's the whole thing. I don't, I don't pretend like, I don't pretend like I don't have those moments. I definitely did because I just, I lost control of the model. I, I just, all I had to do was intervene at one of these points. I could have just changed my self-talk. I could just said, oh yeah, I mean, you're going to spend five bucks, but it's a tax write-off and yeah, they're stealing your money, but at least you get the tax deduction. Not, you know, not a big deal. Or I could have just been more mindful and just said, okay, here I am. And, and we'll go much deeper into each kind of section. But when I get, start to get frustrated or angry, I just say, okay, I'm sitting in a car. I'm wearing brown shoes. Both hands are on the wheel. I see a car. And then you, once you, that you just converse with yourself about what you're doing, and then all this other stuff goes away because if you're mindful of what you're doing right now in the moment, then you're not becoming frustrated with what possibly might happen in the future. Oh, I'm going to run out of gas, or I'm going to be late, or this is you know, dumb. And, Again, it, it all spirals out of control, so that's why it's uh, so systematic right here. And that's why, especially for introverts, the self-talk is so important. So 
there are ways that we have that you can deal with your self-talk. So the number one, the number one most highlighted, you can look this up. In any book, if you have on Kindle, you can type in the 10 most highlighted passages. And that's what I based my seminar around. It's like, okay, you know, I've sold, you know, a few number of books. If this is the passage that comes up all the time, then this is what I'm going to focus on a lot in my seminar. The number one is, you know, talk to yourself like you talk to your friend. And, and the way I put it is, if you talk to, you know, if Cole talked to a friend of his who was driving, the way he was talking to himself, he wouldn't have a friend, <laughs> right? The friend would be like, God, I don't want to be with this guy. You know, he's freaking out over nothing. Oh, well, you're going to be late. You're 10 minutes late, not a big deal, dude, right? Who, who cares? This isn't a life or death situation. So if you, talk to, if you talk to yourself the way you talk to a friend, then immediately your mood is going to improve because you're not beating yourself down all the time. Now, the way you talk to your friend, too, it doesn't mean you're li you don't lie to a friend. You know, if a friend, I, you know, a friend says, hey, I broke up, really sad here. Well, you're not going to be like, well, you got broken up with because you're pathetic and you'll never have a relationship. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to love you. You're just not good enough. Right? The, fr the friendship is going to end there, but who here has been in a relationship where you break up? And that's kind of what you're saying to yourself, right? I'm never going to be loved. I'm never going to meet anybody. I'm just not good enough. I, al I always ruin things. You don't want to do that. And that also goes to avoid speaking in absolutes. When you're frustrated with yourself, you always talk in absolutes. I always make the same mistake. I always do this. I'm never going to be this. I'm never going to have that. I'm never going to be deserving of this. Which is, of course, you know, it's nonsense. <laughs> there, you, you have no idea. You, ha you have actually no idea. That, I mean, in, in a way, too, it's also like right now life is going good for me. And I don't even speak in absolutes like your life is going to be great all the time because I'm like, man, it can all be taken away real fast. But then you've got to build yourself back up. So the big self-talk key is you want to avoid speaking in absolutes. Why does this always happen to me? Well, no, it doesn't always happen to you. It's happening to you right now. The only reason you're frustrated is because it usually doesn't happen. You wouldn't be if, if it always happened to you, then you wouldn't be frustrated because that would be your normalcy. That would be your baseline status. Well, things are always going wrong all the time in my life, and you would just be immune or numb to it by now. So it's just not true. It's counterfactual. So you want to avoid that. Why does this always happen to me? Or, Everything is ruined. I know people like this. I don't talk to them anymore. You know, Everything is ruined. It's the worst day ever. <laughs> If everything's ruined, man, I, I don't know how you get out of bed because every, every, nothing, everything won't always be ruined. I've been in some bad situations before, and even then, it wasn't ruined. So you want to avoid speaking in absolutes. And again, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of you're hijacking the conversation with yourself. And that's what I mean by these practical kind of mindset shifts. Yes. Yes. This pack. Yes. Gotcha. Broke the fourth wall right there. <laughs> You're not supposed to see this, guys. All right. Better now? Yeah, so you want to avoid speaking in absolutes. And the way this works is, again, it's just specific things. That's why when I teach people, I never pretend like some kind of like guru or god. I'm just like I'm a regular guy figuring things out as you go. If all you do is you find yourself frustrated, if all you do is you stop saying, my God, this always happens to me, if all you just says, oh, you know, this is happening to me right now, and thankfully, thankfully, the biggest problem in my life right now is I'm stuck in traffic. What a, what a blessed life I live, right? This is, what, this is what I'm worried about. So if that's all you do is you flip this stuff, like I, I'm so blessed that I'm frustrated by what essentially is a trivial situation, something that most people, a problem that most people in the world would have, would love to have. Now, of course, the reason you have to learn this stuff is because cognitively we're not equipped for that. You know, hedonic adaptation, no matter where you are in life, even if it's really bad, you get used to it. If it's really good, you get used to it. You're, the way dopamine interacts with so that's why like a novel experience is always more fun than the experience, even if you have it again. So, I mean, rationally, if we were rational human beings, which of course we're not, if you were rational, every time you did something, it would feel as good as the first time. Because objectively, nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is your subjective interaction with that experience. And thus, your hormonal milieu is different and, and changes. So that's why you think, well, everything is ruined, even if it's a trivial problem. 
because you got used to a pretty good life where the, the kind of problems that most of us have are, are, are beautiful, especially compared to, say, you know, what I would see in Cambodia. Then you want to turn a critical statement about yourself into a question. Rather than blame and talk down to yourself, ask, how can I prevent making the same choice in the future? Now here's why this is highlighted too. A lot of this is based on my own life. People always go, hey, you know, the haters ever get you down. I'm like, man, if you heard what I said to myself, what the, what the nastiest person on the internet says to me is like a three. The stuff I say to myself is like an eight or a nine. So of course they don't. But all those, and, and that's the, the, true for everybody, right? I mean, haters only get you down if you believe the haters. And you only believe the haters if you adapt what they're saying to you into your own head. And then, of course, that is where self-talk originates. Nobody, you know, if you told people, oh, you know, you have a conversation you had, most people think you're insane. So you learned how to talk from your parents, your teachers, your authority figures. Everybody wanted to control you, right? That's where you learned self-talk. So people tell you, because you rarely get in society and life, you rarely get people expressing gratitude. You rarely get people offering you assurances. When you t if you tell a friend, hey, I have a business idea, that he'll tell you, you know, or she'll tell you five reasons it's going to fail. Rarely does somebody just say, hey, you know, it's a good idea. How can I help? What can I do for you? This is a, you know, great. You almost never hear it. Instead, you hear, well, there's here's five reasons. It won't work. And then you wonder why is it that you're running dialogue is that, well, this, can't, this will never work. Well, because that's where you've got. You've been brainwashed for 20 years by culture and by society and to believing that there's always going to be a problem. And then you're focusing on all the problems instead of all the possibilities. So which, what I mean is you turn, take the critical statement into a question. And that's why, you know, growth of mindset isn't the, the feel good, you're beautiful, just learn to love yourself. There's nothing I hate more than that. Just learn to love yourself. Namaste. And then everything will work its way out. I don't know, you know, maybe you're a bad person. You might be, right? I used to be a pretty bad person. I'm not going to pretend that I was kind of insufferable, especially in my early 20s. So, but rather than just say you're an insufferable person, you just say, well, how can you become less insufferable today? Are you being insufferable right now, right? Are you in the present moment being the kind of person or doing the things that you want to do to become a different person? So rather than just say, God, you're insufferable, I can't believe it, I'm stuck inside, you know, and of course the conversations with you are like recursive, where you're telling yourself, God, you're insufferable, I can't believe I'm stuck with you, you know, this is my life, and you realize, like, it's just you, though. You're just one consciousness. But there's these, these running dialogues. So instead of that, you just say, well, how can I do one thing that's making me to be less insufferable? Or like a big self-talk, I would just say, if you have a vision for yourself, you might just say, right now, in this moment, am I doing something that's going to make me less insufferable? And then you find out, just, you just be nice to people. If, that's what I always tell people. If you want to make more, just start being nice to people. Be nice to everybody. Interact with people. And of course, we'll talk to that, about that in Charisma. Just interact with people and be nice to people. And you're going to become less insufferable. And then you get into affirmations and mantra, which is, again, part of like self-talk. Now, everybody has you know, affirmations. Scott Adams uses them. Hulk Hogan uses them. Everybody's a little bit, they do, true story. Now, everybody's are a little bit different. And people have a different kind of perspective. So Hulk Hogan, when he was going through the, the Gawker trial, and you can read the article about this, would say, you know, God is on my side. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of God's love. I'm going to win this. I'm worthy of God's love. That, for me, that wouldn't work. For me, I, would say, that's, I wouldn't like that. That is up to you to decide. That's the whole point. That's why there's a whole chapter on mantras. I wouldn't just say, you know, if, if I were in a stressful situation, I wouldn't say, you're worthy, you're worthy of God's love, God loves you, you're going to win. That's going to have no impact on me. That might work for you, it might not. I can't, I can't tell you that. That's why you have to work on everything by yourself. But that was, that was kind of like Hulk Hogan's. So for me, mine is just like I'm unstoppable. That's how I view myself. Is you, 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 like you keep ha hitting at me, hating on me, trying to take me down, hit pieces, coming after me. My mantra isn't I'm liked. My mantra isn't I'm worthy of love. My mantra isn't I'm a great human being. My mantra isn't God loves me and therefore everything's going to be okay. My mantra is just like I'm unstoppable. So I don't care. Keep hitting me with your dumb little things. Keep coming at me with your snide little hit pieces. I don't care. 
So for me, that's just the thing. I'm just going to keep pushing through it. I'm unstoppable. That works for me. Again, it might not work for you. You might need something else, and that's why I don't judge that. Another one is, and this isn't really a mantra. This is more of a reframe, but a lot of this stuff, there isn't. Uh, here's kind of a segue. Is A friend of mine is big into mindfulness training, and he read Gorilla Mindset, and he got very frustrated. And I go, what's wrong? He goes, your mindfulness section is wrong. And I go, well, you're not being very mindful right now, right? It sounds like you're making a judgment about my mindfulness section. And why do you care so much if my mindfulness definition is wrong? So it's the same way with mantra. I'm not going to say, oh, this is what a mantra is, and anybody who does something differently, it's not, that's not a real mantra. That's so weird, but I, I thought that was really funny. Like, wow, I was like, wow, you're not present right now because you're being very judgmental and you're not just perceiving my definition. So one is just, this is a great challenge. I'll test my resolve and will. Even if I don't win, I'll grow strong, stronger, right? So for me, whenever I face adversity, I actually enjoy it because, like, wow, I got through this. This is amazing. You know, you don't always get through it and feel great about yourself. But if you just realize things are going to happen anyway, and you think this is a great challenge, I get to test myself. And that's something that we do in maybe high school or college or occasionally, but rarely do you put yourself in a situation that's challenging. Like right now, you're testing yourself, right? You're testing yourself by showing up, by interacting, by you know, being non-judgmental. And then as you do that and you adopt that mindset, then you want more and bigger challenges. And in a way, that's why I do some kind of like my stunts is when I was in an event, I'm going to keep it non-political, so I won't give specifics, but there was like 800 to 1,000 people who really particularly didn't like somebody. So I just said when they're over, I'm going to get on the microphone and just lecture these 1,000 people. So I took over the microphone and started saying things about somebody that they liked, and I did it in a very crass way. And they, they, they energy turned, and they're flipping me off, and they're screaming. And yeah, it was... Yeah, it was, it was like Khaleesi's Walk of Shame, at, you know, in Game of Thrones. And I did that just for, not the lulls, just for the challenge. Like, what is it like to have a thousand people hate your guts? So that's what, right? That's a challenge. And so that's why I did it, yeah. So then I come in, I'm like, well, I got, you know, 75, 80 people who actually like me. That's easy. So public speaking, go public speak to a thousand people who hate you. Get through that and feel all right. And then if you have a presentation or a slideshow or something for a sales pitch, that's going to feel like nothing. And then we, we covered that already, which is you want to talk to yourself to uh, the way you talk to a friend, a uh, close family member, something like that, which is interrupt the pattern of conversation. And we use that word a lot. We use hijacking, jamming, and interrupting. Those are my three biggest concepts because our default state is, as human beings, kind of pathetic, frankly. We're pleasure-seeking beings, and we, we avoid pain and we seek pleasure. That goes back to you know, the utilitarians. And that's what we do. We don't want to challenge ourselves too much. That's why it's hard to do things that are helpful. So just our default state is kind of pathetic, frankly. And then when we get things we like, we do get pleasure because we are pleasure-seeking. Then through hedonic adaptation, we adapt to that new level of pleasure and won't even enjoy anymore. So it's a curse. We are we're cursed creatures. That's why I'm so obsessed with mindset, because if you think about just the base state of humanity, it's, it's not an easy ride. No, nobody, nobody with consciousness in a body has an easy ride, because even when you get what you want, you want more, because now you value, you know, everything that you do today, you judge by what you did yesterday, and then you're holding yourself up to a new standard, and eventually that new standard becomes impossible. That's fine. I mean, to me, that's fun. To me, it's fun to do, to know that what I did last year, as big as it was, this year's going to be bigger, right? But the flip side to that is, if eventually I hit a, a plateau, I'm not going to say, well, you blew it, you lost, you're, you're over, the ride's over. I'm going to just talk the same way I talk to a friend, and you deconstruct the situation. Look to new habits, look to new patterns. That's how you want to talk to other people. The, that's the way you want to talk to yourself, the way you talk to uh, the friends. And again, chances are, I mean, it's not chances, it's just 100% true. Unless you're a serial killer or something, you're, you're way meaner to yourself than you are to other people. And that's why you're not having good relationship with yourself. And that is where the traditional self-help stuff, which I don't like, 
does have some value. Most people have very bad relationships with themselves. This is how you build a better relationship through open and honest communication with yourself. So see how we talk self-talk, but then that links to mood, links to mindfulness. But you know, links to vision too. You have to have a vision for your life, and we're going to get there at the very end. So that's why we keep referring to this, because I want to reinforce the point that even if you get really good at self-talk, it isn't over. You might be really good at self-talk, but then if you let yourself become in a bad mood, get into a bad mood, then your self-talk is going to change. So you always want to think on how everything interacts. The same thing is true of vision. You, how do you say to yourself, am I in this moment doing what I want to do to become who I want to be, if you don't know what that end destination is or who you want to become or what you want to do. So you have to have a vision too so that they always, they always connect. Frame control is part of self-talk. And it's probably the most important part of self-talk. So frame control is how you reword things. So if you've ever seen, you know, anybody who ever tries to interview me, they get very frustrated with me because they'll say, well, you said this thing. So then what I do is I mention five other people who said way worse things. And I go, why have you written articles about those five people? They said way worse things than I did. Well, it's not about them. It's about you. Well, no. You know, I'm not going to cuss, but F you. No, it's not. Who are you? You know, just because you work for New York Times, you can tell me what the conversation's about? No, you don't get to tell me what the conversation's about. It's about whatever I want to talk about. That's the, that's the way I view it. I don't view it as they just get to ask me whatever they want and I'm going to answer it. I view it as I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. I'm going to reframe it. And the same thing is true with the own conversations you have. If you don't like the conversation you're having with yourself, change it. The number one rule of marketing, public relations, if you don't like the conversation, change the conversation. So that works for everybody from Coca-Cola to all of us here. If they're saying Coca-Cola has too much sugar, then you say, you know, it's a shame there's so much saturated fat in bacon. Well, even though it's a lie and bacon is actually way better for people than Coca-Cola, you're reframing it now. So instead of them saying there's sugar in Coca-Cola, or if they say, well, Coca-Cola uses high fructose corn syrup, then I would say, well, yeah, and that supports farmers. Do you hate farmers in America? You don't like corn farmers in Iowa? Good, good, good right? So what I, rather, than, rather than let the opponent set the frame and then defend myself against whatever accusation they're making, what I'm doing is I'm just going to completely reframe the conversation to talk about whatever I want to talk about. And that's because that's what I do all the time in my own head. So in my own head, when I'm saying, you know, geez, I can't believe you did this time. It's over with. You finally went too far or whatever. I reframe it and think, it's amazing. Dude. I just push myself to a new boundary, to a new level, to a new limit. And that's why I feel insecure or raw or vulnerable. Because I, I did go. I did go too far. And I went too far, and that's fantastic. Because most people never go far enough. All I'm doing is changing the conversation I'm having with myself. It's a different conversation. And then, of course, once you do it, you, know, you got to be careful with friends and family. They'll, you know, they'll find it tedious, but because you're like, no, we're going to talk about you right now. <laughs> Enough about me. So that's how you reframe. You're changing the conversation. There's also, oh, I, f I forget his name. Who, um, somebody here knows the answer to this. Who, who are the two behavioral e uh, economists? They just had the book out, Thinking Fast and Slow. Like, con con there you go. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, so economists. So, they did a bunch of research on framing, and it goes, you know, with well, a classic example is if you're a doctor and you sit to a patient and you go, here are your treatment options, and there's a 20% chance you're going to die. Well, most people are like, well, look at your eyes got bigger. Like, well, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Horrible, right? What kind of monster would tell a patient that, well, okay. Well, Peter, there's an 80% chance you're going to live if you try this treatment. Oh, okay. Well, it's the same thing. Rationally, there's no difference. It's 80-20. 80% 80 you're going to live, 20% you're going to die. It's how you, frame, how you frame the alternatives. So if you frame it as there's a 20% risk that you're going to die, then you're going to be like, oh, well, this is terrible. There's no reason. I would never take that chance. But if I said, well, here's your options. There's an 80% chance you're going to live. Well, then you're going to think, oh, that's actually pretty good. That's more than a coin flip. That, OK, maybe I'll play those odds. It's a, it's a different way. So that's the way you frame things. So, we tend to think because we've been brainwashed and thinking that humans are rational and that we're rational, which is, uh, we're not. Humans aren't and, and we're not. We can try a little bit. 
maybe you know five or ten percent of our chances are free and rational but for the most part it is the way we frame things so if you're rational you would say it shouldn't matter if I tell you there's a twenty percent chance you're gonna die and there's eight percent chance you're, it's the same how, how can you be bothered because we're not so once you fundamentally accept and just embrace your own irrational nature then you can become as Dan really said predictably irrational which is a great book and kind of it that's he probably that's probably what got me to mindset when I read his book, sort of, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, whenever it came out, it's the idea that whatever decision you're going to make today can change in 30 seconds if people are, put you in an aroused state. And they did a lot of like kind of really creepy stuff. So they would, did college kids, and they go, okay, would you have you know, intercourse with somebody who's passed out? And everybody's like, God, no, right? It's, who would do that? So they asked a bunch of questions, and then they had them watch like internet pornography. And then a few minutes later, they start asking their questions, and then their people, their minds differently, and they're answering the, you know, a little bit differently. The, and you're, so, situational ethics that you've heard of, well, there is also a mood-based ethics. So, if you allow, if you change your aroused state, you're going to make different decisions. Now, if you're if we were rational, that would be, of course, that would never happen. But it's not. It's so much based on the the state that you have, which again is is your mindset. So. You're always reframing things whenever possible. And you always want to, when you can, reframe a problem as a possibility. You know, Ryan Holiday wrote the book, Kind of the Obstacle is the Way, which is sort of a whole book on this, which is kind of the same way. You're, you're hitting an obstacle, oh my God, what, what do I do? Well, you think, well, that's where you want to be. Because most people aren't going to go there. And if you want to live a life better than most people and, and get rid of this wretched human experience that we all have, then you have to find the obstacle and then you overcome it. So you can view it as, I hit a wall, which we all thought, I hit a wall, right? Well, okay, I hit a wall, I'm going to go around it, I'm going to crawl, I'm going to dig a hole, and I'm going to go underneath it. I'm going to build a ladder and climb up on the ladder. Or maybe a friend of mine has a ladder, so I'm going to reach out to that friend and say, hey, I, there's this wall over here, can we get a ladder, you help me climb up the ladder. So what you're doing is you're reframing a challenge as a possibility. So you can view a problem as an end state, or you can be, view a problem as a beginning, and you can view a problem as possibility. Maybe you'll connect with a person in a way that you wouldn't have because you've reached out for help. Because you said, perhaps you can help me get over this wall. Do you have a ladder? Can I use your ladder? That's ultimately what communities are built on. And I mean, and that, of course, is why my politics are ultimately based on my mindset. Communities are based on trust, possibility, believing you can reach out to others. And then once you destroy the trust of a culture, then you've now destroyed, you've destroyed the culture more than, it, more than anything else. So mindset, even everything you're learning here, it, it applies to the collective sort of hive mind that we're part of. So here's a good one. Who here has had a baby? There we go. How, who else? We got moms here? How, how painful is childbirth, right? They, they shot me up, so. OK, OK, OK. Yeah, but was, you were afraid before you went into pregnancy, before you went into labor, yeah, right? I liked the natural was much better than the decision. So you did it, you did, did you do a natural childbirth? Up until a certain point. Yeah. And then they right, right, right. It was much, it was better before, but I didn't get to the critical point. Which okay. Was, but were you, well, you know, everybody's different, but yeah, it's painful, right? I just, we can all yeah, agree. It's painful. Yeah. Did you do natural childbirth? Yeah, Shauna did it. Shauna did natural childbirth. No, yeah, and we did a whole mindset coach for the whole thing, mindset whole program. So she took no pain, that doesn't invalidate anybody's experience or, or more validate hers, but no pain medication, no, it was just all meditation and self-hypnosis. We took, of course, hypno babies, and then we combined it with gorilla mindset. So the, right, so we reframed everything. So what you learn in hypno babies, because I couldn't have come up with this because, I don't know, because why would I, why, why the hell would I know, right? <laughs> But an example is that you have a contraction. Everybody knows what a contraction is, right? Well, if you view a contraction unconsciously, like, oh, another, another contraction, well, what you learn to do in the Hypno Babies course, which I don't sell, I'm an affiliate, so if you guys sell it, I won't make any money off of this, which is a problem. I need to reach out to them <laughs> and tell them I can sell a lot of courses. This would be, it might not seem on brand for you, but trust me, if you got me as a spokesperson. So if you call a contraction a pressure wave, feels different, right? It just sounds different. If I said you're going to have a pressure wave and the wave is going to last 30 to 60 seconds, unconsciously you're like, oh, so it's a wave, so it's going to peak and then it's going to flow down. I know what a wave is. So 
the, the truth is that we all think we know this like truth, this absolute fundamental truth, but so much of life outside of uh, laws of physics, there is no truth. It's socially constructed and it's constructed within ourselves. So who's to say a pressure wave is inaccurate and contraction is the right term? Who decided what became socially constructed? Doctors or whoever decided what's going to be called a contraction. We're going to call it a contraction. We're going to teach it as a contraction. And that's the truth. No, that's socially constructed. But if you deconstruct it, you can realize that it's just it's a pressure wave. It's a wave. It's going to come. And then if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I got a pressure wave. Oh, OK, but I, I know what a wave is. I intuitively, I know what a wave is. So it's not going to be the end of it. It's just a wave. It's going to flow. It's going to flow. So you learn that in hypno waves. Um, labor comes birthing time. I mean, let's think about what we do to women. It's terrible with, with the baby. The, I mean, you know, I, I don't think anybody's going to call me, you know, people are not going to call me like some kind of feminist or something. But when I learned about pregnancy, I was like, dude, this is terrible what we're doing to women. I, I can't believe this. The brainwashing, right? Labor. You're going to go into labor. That doesn't sound fun. You're about to have a new life. Your life is about to fundamentally change, and you're going to have the experience of being a parent. What, what a magical, amazing, no, you're going into labor, and you're going to have contractions, and you're going to have pain. That's what women are told. And then you get that message from culture, the water broke. That's actually BS. Any woman knows that. You, it isn't like you watch a TV show, oh my god, the water broke, get in the car, everybody rush in the car, it's an emergency. No, it's actually not true at all. You measure the pressure waves, you can time this stuff. There's apps that can do all this stuff. But if you, you know, so I went to this experience thinking, oh my God, you know, the water breaks, you better run, it's like an emergency. People call ambulances and stuff. Actually, it's all, it's all nonsense. And then you have contractions, and then you go into, you have all this pain. So just call it discomfort. Because who's to say what's true or not? Who's to say that it isn't discomfort? Why call it pain? Right? That's a choice. It's a choice you make, and it's a choice. Well, actually, it's not a choice you made. It's a, a thing you've been brainwashed to believe. Women are brainwashed to believe it's painful, rather than it's just discomfort. They're brainwashed to believe it's And we're all brainwashed wrong ways. So, I mean, this is one of many, if you ever want to deconstruct society, this is a way, there's a social construct up here around the concept of birth. And then I don't want to get too political even, because this really makes people mad. But, you know, watch the, the, what is it, The Business of Giving Birth? Is that the film, Sean? Yeah, The Business of Being Born. You know, we could talk about C-section rates and everything. I could, I could do a whole, I'm very passionate about childbirth. I just, I stay out of it because it's a little off-brand, you know, for me to talk about. But I, I can go on and on about it because I get really fired up about the way, the way we handle it in America. And then, of course, when, when Sean and I worked together with this, you know, she'd gone to the gym with me. So I just like, hey, so, you know, we'd done leg day. So we just decided, okay, your pressure waves are like a rough set of squats. So you're going to do some squats today, and, and you, can, you can do anything. And then another thing that we'd use is you can do anything for 60 seconds, right? If you know it's going to be over, and you just tell yourself and you reframe it instead of just saying it's this pain, and then focusing on the painful state, you go, well, I can do anything for 60 seconds. It's a pressure wave. It's going to pass. You've now reconceptualized your definition of pain. And because of that, your subjective experience of pain changes. That's another thing. Pain is, I mean, there are some things like if you came in and you know, hit me with a bat and broke my arm, there's going to be a certain pain that's going to affect that. But subjectively, that's going to influence your pain in, in many ways. So subjectively, it's still going to be discomfort. Nobody's going to ever have an easy birth, necessarily. But we did it, what? Well, not we, Sean, at two and a half hours or so? From the time we got to the center, though. Three hours from the time we went to the midwifery, and then we had it. And then she had a doula. Again, I can talk about this stuff all day, but <laughs> not really the Mike Cernovich brand. Don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> and then, of course, too, speaking of pain rather than just discomfort, it, it, once you just realize, like, it's inevitable. We, we, you know, naturally, our, our primary base state is that's painful, therefore I won't do it. That's pleasurable, therefore I'm going to kind of seek it out. Once you just accept, hey, man, life is just going to suck sometimes. There's no way around it then you become more at peace with it. And that is more kind of like a Stoic thing, becoming. That's where I differ from the Stoics, is I think they can become too emotionally numb. And in a lot of ways, Stoicism is about running from problems and running from the human condition and the human experience. 
whereas I think emotions and feeling are beautiful, I don't want to be inured and, and numb to all feeling. But that's where the wisdom of stoicism is. Sometimes you're just like, it sucks, dude. Yeah, get over it. It's going to suck sometimes. That's the way life is. Once you've accepted that, you feel like you now have control. Because a lot of this stuff, too, is you feel loss of control. Mindset is a choice. And when you accept that mindset is a choice, and then you can control that choice in the moment, then everything makes more sense and your subjective reality changes. Spiritual growth is physical. This is why pain is good. There, my best writing is 2013 to 2015. Everything I'm doing now is riding that wave that I did. So I don't know if anybody's seen the pictures of me where my skin was like falling off or my neck was bleeding and I couldn't move. Yeah, I couldn't get out of bed. Yeah. Yeah. Agonizing pain. Agonizing pain. And the only reason that I'm able to do what I'm doing and play the game at such a high level is because physical growth leads to spiritual depth. And, you know, in our post God is dead society, we don't, you can't use the word spiritual, you know, what is that, religion or something? And we're supposed to hate religion, how scary is that? The idea though that you have a spirit or an essence or an aura, or that there's something, or the ghost in the machine or whatever you want to call it, there's something more to it than thus, than thus this um, simple pleasure-seeking pain avoidance machine, then you just reframe it, I'm in, I'm in physical pain, a lot of spiritual growth. I'll give you an example. The, um, when I was in a lot of pain, I thought to myself, like, this is great because once I get through this, I'm going to be able to do other things that I thought were easy or that I thought were hard. So I used to think public speaking was hard. I used to think that going to a meetup that I hosted where a bunch of people would show up and want to say hi to me, I, I would complain about that. You know, God, I'm just so tired. I'm an introvert. This isn't my way. I used to think that was hard. But I viewed this horrific kind of experience in my life as an opportunity for spiritual growth. And then, I, so I just kept thinking, well, once this is over, this is like a training camp. Once this is over, I'm going to be so well equipped to handle anything bad that happens in life. And that's where the spiritual growth is physically painful comes from. And we talk, you know, embrace the suck. Just, it's going to suck, dude. You, you learn that, you know, in the, um, you know, the army or whatever, any kind of military thing. You have a rucksack on and your feet are bleeding and your hips hurt and you're hunched forward. And guess what? Yeah, everybody's in pain. Everybody around you is in pain. You might as well just embrace it because it isn't going to go away. So you can either complain about it or fight or you can just embrace it that it's going to happen. And again, this is, mindset is about changing your subjective interaction with your experiences. So again, you see how everything's coming together, right? Is everybody, is it all making sense? Yes. Self-talk frame. Vision, which we'll get to at the very end. Vision is what I call playing offense. Right now we're doing what I call playing defense. And as you know, I'm an offensive player. By defense, I mean is like, well, how do I solve this problem that I have? I'm in a position I don't want to be in. How do I get through it? That's defense. Vision is offense. Vision is, okay, like I know how now to go through the bad days, but then how can I live an amazing, spectacular, aspirational existence? We'll get to there, but not yet. All right, wait, we need to go back. Mindfulness, what's mindfulness mean? Rob. Stand up, please, sir. Okay. What do you say, David? I would, I'd say the same. Um, being present in your being and being present with your thoughts in the moment, not projecting forward or back. What about right, Brad? Uh, just taking control, overcoming. All right. I'm supposed to have the, the perfect... I don't know what happened. All right, Shauna, you're fired from slideshow. <laughs> so mindfulness is being, they, they would say it's being or it's perceiving, not judgment, which, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever taken a Myers-Briggs like, kind of thing. So the archetypes they give you are basically nonsense. 
But there are people who are more judgers versus perceivers. And I'm definitely a judger. You know, I, I, this guy is an idiot. I hate this person. I, mean, I have a lot of hate in my To be honest, I have a lot of hate in my heart, and I have to work through it every day of my life. But you know, it, immediately when I'm in a situation, I'm just going to name list 10 reasons why this is a bad position, and I should have just stayed home. And why don't you just go home? Everything is great there. You got your dog, Cyrus, Sean is there. Why are you talking? Right? Not to you guys, but you know, I find myself in some dodgy situations. So per perception is where you're just in the moment. Now, taken too far, if you just perceive things, then you would die, right? That, so it's kind of dumb to say, well, never judge. If you're um, just perception, not judgment, namaste, well, you're going to walk into a wall then, because you wouldn't know it's a wall. You wouldn't know that there's these constructs that exist in the physical realm, and you walk into them. Oh, I'm just perceiving, not judging, you, you, you would fall over a cliff because you wouldn't have a conception that you know, this is a cliff and you don't want to walk over a cliff because you'll die and dying is bad. Well, the fact that you think dying is bad is a judgment. So the, the, you know, the hippy-dippy people take this stuff way too far. But, but you know, everything is a Hegelian dialectic. Most of us judge right, too much. The problem most of us have isn't that we're going to fall over a cliff because we're so in the moment and so in the flow that we don't realize there's a cliff. The most problems the bigger problem we all have is we're just judging people, judging ourselves, judging our environment. That's why you know, we live in such an entitlement age. We're just judging the environment. The environment isn't giving me enough. I'm not having what I should have. Well, that's, that's a value judgment you make. So then the question is, well, how can you become more mindful? Right? So earlier we mentioned Cole. He lost his mindfulness, and because he lost his mindfulness, he was angry. And the reason he lost his mindfulness is because he judged the situation. He judged LA traffic, judged the people in traffic, judged the cars, judged you know the entire state of California. You know, that's what I do. Let me find a pothole. You know, don't be. I'll talk to you about my tax dollars and how I'm being robbed and you know everything. So you don't you don't you don't want to you don't want to be there. So one of the best ways to do it is when you're judging yourself or you're judging a situation, that's where you want to go, am I choosing in this moment to be the type of person I want to become? Which, by the way, that is the number one most highlighted passage in Gorilla Mindset. That's, the, you know, big data. Everybody thinks we got robots. We just got big data and we know how to read it. So big data is, am I choosing in this moment to be the type of person I want to become? That could be a mantra that you live by because it embeds so many different structures. Choosing. Because one thing I like to do is I've taken a lot of you know, courses on language and semiotics and things. So you can deconstruct a sentence you know, in law, of course, too. Is, well, if you're asking yourself, am I choosing, you've actually played a game on somebody, right? You're presupposing it's a choice. Most of us don't. Most of us passively accept the bad moods. I'm in a bad mood, woke up on the wrong side of the bed. That's just the way it's going to be. It's going to be one of those days, right? Who has ever said that? It's just one of those days. Why? Why? Because you chose that. Yeah, you chose to passively accept it. You've chose to just say, just going to be one of those days, I'm going to passively accept the day, and that's the end of it. So this here is just saying, well, wait a minute, am I choosing to feel this way? Now you're holding yourself accountable. In this moment, well, that's fundamentally mindfulness. Am I choosing right now, in this moment, so now you're checking in, to be the type, because to be the type, right? a person I want to become, becoming his vision, becoming as who you want to be, finding who you are. So that encapsulates everything. Am I choosing in the moment to be the kind of person I want to become? So if you're being you know, mean to other people or being mean to yourself or being in a bad situation or you're afraid, then that's just the way to check in. That's the guerrilla mindset hack or the guerrilla mindset shift. It's the jam. It's am I choosing in this moment to be the type of person I want to become? And then a lot of times you're like, no, I'm, I'm actually not. You know, right now I'm home, I'm hungover, I, I drank, so I'm choosing to never have a successful business on the side, right? People, people always go, Sarnovich, how would you get into this? I was like, well, contrary to the fake news things about alimony and stuff, which I made up, by the way, because I thought it was funny. <laughs> I, like to see what peop I like to see what people believe. So I've actually thrown out things that I thought were so ridiculous that nobody would ever accept as true, and I've learned that you have to be more careful because people are more gullible. Yeah, people are a little more gullible maybe than you think. 
So you have, you have the idea of you know, who you want to become. So people go, oh, well, you know, how do you do what you do for a living? I go, well, I was a lawyer, and I went home, and for 20 minutes a night I wrote a blog, and it was a .wordpress.com blog. I didn't even know how to have it. I didn't even know how to have my own domain. I couldn't even have Cernovich.com and install WordPress into a blog. So I just went and had a you know, free WordPress blog, and I typed away, and then things picked up. And then on the weekends, I worked on it, right? And then I kept going. So that's where it started. So there are people right now hungover. Well, how are you going to become anything in your life? That's what you're doing on a Saturday. You're hungover, <laughs> being a degenerate. Yeah. Hey, Brad. off in traffic or whatever, do you have any like anchor words or something you do? Exactly. Say? Uh, right now. All right. There's this guy in front of me. He has a rectangular badge, B-R-A-D. The R is kind of hooked. There's no loop on the other end. It sort of floats one way, kind of like an arc. And, that's, and he has a blue shirt on. There are five buttons. I'm, I'm look, right? So that's the way you just check in. Because if I'm just checking in, now I'm mindful, now I'm present, now I'm connected. Right? So instead of thinking, oh, wait, what question did he just ask me? What did you just say? What's my answer going to be? Am I going to give him a good enough answer? Is he going to like it? I'm just thinking, okay, here. So I'm, I'm actually physically looking at what is going on, right? And I'm not making judgments either, at least initially. So when I would, first of all, when I started doing a podcast, nobody taught me how to do one. I was just, okay, I'm looking at this microphone. It's a, this orb. There are some little slits on the side. And then I would just start doing things. And then it would happen. So that, that's, how I, that's how I check in. That is... The easiest, so if you're driving, yeah, go ahead. Um, on your podcast, how do you keep yourself from saying, um? You learn. You learn, and you can't be afraid of pause. Everybody's afraid of silence. <laughs> I would rather say something dumb than to say nothing at all, because a pause to you feels like a long time. But was that a long pause? No. no. But if you're thinking, what am I going to say next? Well, I better just keep talking. I better just keep rambling. The, then a, a lot of that too is breathing, which will connect you too. So you just say, here I am, right now, there's a pause, I'm breathing, I'm collecting myself, uh, left foot in front of the right foot. Yes? All right, well, I mean, what, it, what does racing look like to you? What thoughts? Uh, you don't know what's coming. Interview's about to happen. You don't know if they're going to throw at you. Are you afraid? There's obviously the fear of the unknown. What are you afraid of? That your competition will leave you. You're afraid you're not going to get the job. Yeah. Why do you want the job? Because I don't want them to be my boss. Who don't you want to be your boss? Uh, it's, it's like in a promotional setting. Right. So you see how you just had a self-talk. And you see how you're talking about things that you don't even know are going to happen. And if you allow yourself to get worked up like, it, so what you want to do is when you, when you analyze your behavior, is you go, my thoughts race out of control. That's a metaphor. There's a great book, Meta Metaphors We Live By, by George Lakoff. And the, the fundamental premise of the book is that there are all these metaphorical structures embedded in our language that affect how I live. So you say, my thoughts spiral out of control. So that's what? A spiral. You don't think about it. This It's a spiral, right? My thoughts are racing out of control like an engine. I, I can't control it, right? That's a metaphor you have. So rather than just say my thoughts are racing out of control, how can I stop my thoughts from racing out of control? You just look at your thoughts. What are your thoughts? Right? You examine those. And then as you examine those thoughts, you can change them. But if all you do is like, you know, things are going out of control, what am I going to do? I don't want this job. Then you're, you're going to lose control and you're not going to be present in the mood. And of course, you're not going to get what you want. So for example, I don't know what I'm going to say next. I don't know what I'm going to do before I give a seminar. I've given f you know, five, six of these. And Nestor can tell you, is this one different from the last one? Yeah. yeah. So every seminar I've ever given is different because I don't know what I'm going to talk about before I get in. I just become fully immersed and fully present. And Sean will tell you, I, I just don't talk to anybody. I become um, immersed in the moment and the mood. And then as I talk to people and hear what people have to say, then I, then I know that we can, you know, we can change things as we need to. And that, again, is as if I'll be present. So if I, don't, if I come into, and I'm not saying don't be prepared, always be prepared. But 
if you think that you're going to dominate the conversation, you're going to have a worse conversation. And that's why we're going to talk about charisma in the next section. Right? So right, you think that you have control over the interview, but you really don't. The other person has control of the interview. So you're, you're going to have to learn how you can gain power by giving the other person power. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about that frequently um, highlighted phrase, and I think the issue with uh, the media and how we've been programmed is that we've been given a, a lot of poor types of people to become. And so I think that's kind of a deeper issue is that to re examine what types of configures and Yeah, exactly, and that's where you know you gotta eventually decide. You know, because uh, here's a funny example, actually. So Der Spiegel just did an article about me, and if anybody from like Der Spiegel or these like snowy you know publications write about you, they all say I have a small house. <laughs> now, I think I live in a mansion. You know, to me, I'm like, wow, I I, I live in this amazing house. But if you ha if you buy into the culture game and the social status game then you're just like, oh wow, this is a small house and it's in a subdivision. And then of course you wonder, and then they're wondering like, well why can't we connect with normal people? Because you say things like that, that's how most people live. But to me, I've, I think it's fantastic. I don't, I've lived in a mansion before and I, I don't know why anybody would want to do that. There are empty rooms, people could hide in there, be assassinated easier. <laughs> I'm in a small house. Yeah, but, yeah, we can hire people to clean, but you know, I, there, could be, there could be people hiding in the third guest bedroom over there, you know? The deep state will have the whole thing wired, so <laughs> I want to, yeah, yeah. I would, I'll be in a small, you know, I'll be in a small house because then I can kind of watch things. But, that, but that's what you mean, they'll become, is a lot of what people chase they don't really want. So the, a lot of the disaffection people have is because you're allowing culture to define what you want or who you want to be. And an example of that too is like a lot of women are like, well, you know, I just want to be a mom, but society tells you you can't just be a mom. Society says if a woman just wants to be a mom, that's like a bad thing. And you should really want to do PowerPoint presentations to big pharmaceutical companies because that's what success looks like, right? And, and you're getting that, of course, in culture. And then, you know, men are taught that, well, if you're a man, you want to be a ladies' man. And you want to, but most men just want to be in a relationship. You know, they, they, maybe there's like a phase, but that's not what most men want. So then men will get into a relationship and then they'll be immediately disaffected because they've been taught that you actually want to be in the Corona commercial with five girls in bikinis, even though they're going to be drunk and throwing up, and you're going to try to get rid of them, and you're going to be like, how do I get away from this? And what did I just do? <laughs> so this is, yeah, I know a lot, because I, you know, I bought into a lot of lies. You know, I, I, bought into, I bought into the lies. So checking into the present moment, that's what we talked about earlier years, and this is where self-talk kind of comes in. So you're just saying, I'm here, I see a, a, you know, a box in front of me. And to the extent possible, you want to try to define things abstractly wherever possible. So you could just say, if I'm checking in, I could say, okay, there's a computer. And that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is, I'm walking, there's this, I'm not sure what it is, but the shape here that's kind of curved and I'm, it's leading to this kind of a rectangular thing that's open in a, maybe an oblong way. If you can abstract, that usually helps. Depends on. And then, once you do that with self-talk, you become more mindful. Because again, you're using the techniques you learned earlier with the self-talk. So my, this wouldn't work if your self-talk isn't fixed. If your self-talk is judgmental and angry, then you're going to make yourself angry. You're not going to be mindful. So that's, again, why, they're why each thing is separate. There's a reason these are separate. But then they, there's a reason that they also connect. So if your self-talk is better, then you're not saying negative things, not saying bad things, so then, then it, you're present and you're mindful. But if your self-talk needs work, then that won't work for you. Stand up, make eye contact hi, with my me. Name's Joe. Yes, hi, Joe. Uh, I mean, we all have those certain Joe, types. you're looking at me right all now. Right, man. Um, 
Joe. You have those. Like, <laughs> okay, you're, you're going to look at me, you're going to come up here, and you're going to look at everybody else. Those, those are your choices. All right. So we have all those times. Okay. Um, for uh, a guy with my, my military background, what I've been through, it's I, I have a moment in time where I perceive what's going on, the chaos. And in that chaos, um, I'm more apt to choose to feed that chaos rather than, you know, it maybe softening. Mm -hmm. How much better does eye contact just get? Yeah, Did you guys notice that? Yeah. So, so really, you just answered your own question. You go, we all have these problems, right? You're creating chaos. We all have these problems, and there's this chaos, and we choose to view this chaos, and you're completely disconnected from the situation. But you're here having a conversation with me, but we're not connecting at all, because you're not looking at me. You're in your own head, and then you're letting whatever your own head is saying control the reality and then change the reality, where the answer to your question is, you know, a, a neurological complicated event is going to neurologically have impacts and, and rewire your brain in certain ways, but you can change. And that's just a very specific way you can do is, if you see chaos, it's because you're not connected to anything. Chaos is, by definition, you know, abstract artist, a Jackson Pollock painting. That's chaos. Well, chaos is a lack of focus. But if all you do is you look at your wife or you look at your children and you start checking in with them the way you're checking in with me now, the way you're listening to me now, then there's not going to be chaos around you because chaos is a lack of clarity. And by focusing in and looking in and connecting with the person, you've now shown, you've now shown clarity, right? Does that make sense? So that's one thing you can do today that will change your life in very big ways. Yes. Tom Cotton. I was listening to that. It reminds me of something about myself. Is that uh, I used to really have a lead foot, and I like driving very fast. And that's chaos. You engage chaos, and you become mindful. You become mindful of it all, and you begin to observe patterns. And within the patterns. You engage this Zazen aspect of being, having kind of a complete awareness of it, and that's how I engage mindfulness. Actually, thank you, Tom. Yeah, that's, um, you know, being and doing, there becomes a sort of where it's all the same, you know, because they would say mindfulness is being rather than doing, but your being is based on what you do, and your, who you are is based on habits. So, but yeah, th there is that state. So if I'm talking over here to Joe and I'm making eye contact, in theory, there's chaos around me. Are people looking at me? Is there secretly a person here who's going to kill me? You know, there's all this stuff going on. It could be if I let it, or I can just choose to focus on one specific aspect, and then the, the chaos kind of goes away because now you have focus. So I wish I had, I wish I knew how to lo load video on this, but there's an incre incredible video, and I forget the exact concept from cognitive psychology and cognitive bias, but there's a, and then somebody made a funny beer commercial, but it's inattentional blindness. That is a concept. Inattentional blindness, which is that we're blind to what we're not paying attention to. And the way they illustrate is quite humorously. So they have uh, five people passing a basketball to each other back and forth. And they go, OK, count the number of times, the number of passes. And then you're a good little student, and uh, 11. I won, I won. And they go, OK. Hey, did you see the guy in the gorilla suit who like walked right by him? And you're like, bullshit. You know? Yeah, no. And then you stop it. So the, the guy in the gorilla suit was always there walking in it, but because you were focused on one aspect of the experience, the number of passes, you didn't even notice something that happened. Well, see, it works both ways, right? So it works both ways that there's always going to be life going on. And that's you're not going to ever notice anything that's going on. So chaos is trying to imagine that you can comprehend everything all at once, but really what you just want to try to comprehend is the present moment. 
But then ruthless focus is, you know, Shauna, and this is where Shauna and I disagree. You know, this is about just cutting people out of your life, really. So when you get really good at mindset, then people think that they could just say whatever they want to you because, hey, your mindset, man, w walk it off. You know, who cares? Who cares what I said? And no, because there's a connection between lifestyle and mindset. So the way I put it is, if I didn't sleep at all the night and I got up and I tried to give this, my mindset wouldn't be where it is. I need a certain number of hours of sleep. I need certain things to happen. You know, Ben and Alejandro are great organizing it. If, if my lifestyle here where I'm checking people in, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I'm keeping track of everything, then I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a good of a seminar, right? Because that's a lifestyle choice. So ruthless focus is, and I, mean, and I do this, so your model, this goes against all cultural conditioning, is whenever you interact with somebody, friend or family, once you're done, write one through five. One is, that was amazing, I'm, I'm inspired, I'm encouraged, can't wait to talk to this person again. Five is, I feel like drained, that was like a spiritual vampire. <laughs> and, then, and then three is intermediate. And you rate every time you interact with somebody, fives go away. Every time you have a five, it goes away. And then every time you have a four, it goes away. Then every time you have a three, it goes away. And that's what I mean by ruthless focus is because if you're with negative people or allow negative influences in your life, you're not going to be able to focus on your life vision. You're, you're not going to be able to get everything you want in your life, and you do have to be ruthless. And then you also want to rate activities, which is a lot of us do things that we don't enjoy because we think we're supposed to enjoy them. For example, uh, I've been on Big Yacht. Like, I don't really like, like it that much, you know? Hey, maybe you guys do, but to me, I, I don't really enjoy being on a yacht. I'll occasionally do it for the social media pictures and the social proof and create a, an image or whatever, but I don't, actually, I don't actually like it. So you just rate those activities, because a lot of times you're doing things that you're supposed to like because it's high status or because society's brainwashed you to like it, you find out you don't actually like it. So, the, and the reason this is under mindfulness is because mindfulness is higher consciousness. You're now realizing, okay, I'm being more mindful of how I spend my time. I'm being mindful of what I do. I'm being mindful of who I spend my time with because fundamentally we are our habits and our lifestyles. We are the people we're with and we are the activities we engage in. If you want to get very reductionist, you are the totality of the people you spend your time with and the activities you engage in. If you go do these things, that's what you do. If you go to the gym, you're going to become a gym guy, which is a good thing. I'm not denigrating it. But you're the total of that. And then you're the total of the people you spend your time with. And if you think that that, if you think it isn't true, just try to imagine a time that you're not engaging in an activity or where you're not spending time with people and you won't find one. So there you go. See how self-talk connects to mindfulness? Mindfulness connects to mood. Frame control is connected to self-talk. We, we even got a little bit. We even got a little bit in division all around. So yeah, posture is what Alejandro talked about. And the way to think about posture is the uncon unconscious conversation that you have in yourself. We go back to the first part, mindset. Open or closed, right? Well, if you're sitting like this, unconsciously you're closing off the conversation you're having with yourself, you're closing yourself off to the world. That's signaling all types of negative responses to your body, cortisol and everything. It's been proven. There's a great picture that I posted on my website. I don't have it here. But like the chimpanzees, you can, you can find them. And whenever the bigger chimpanzees around, the other chimpanzees all uh, squinch down, right? Because fundamentally, space is status. And it's a very kind of irrational thing. But the most important guy has the bigger office. If you have a big, that's what people want a big house. But if people think you have a big house, you have more social status. And what a lot of people don't understand about Gorilla Mindset, especially people who've never read it and they just like to hate me all day on the internet is there's almost nothing in the book, if anything, about how to dominate other people. That's not what it's about at all. It's about learning how to control yourself and to dominate your own life. And part of that is reframing these things. So a lot of people, so the reason I'm bringing that up, there is a point to that, is unconsciously space is status and that's within our DNA. So we're going to unconsciously think the person with the bigger house, the bigger swimming pool, the bigger office is a more important person. And that's fine, but you don't have to buy into that.
consciously. You don't have to think, well, I need a bigger house and I need a bigger car. My, I bought my car used, right? I, I don't think I'll ever buy, a new, I'll ever buy a new car. But you have to know that if you're sitting around in a closed off position, you're signaling to your body that you're a low social status. You're signaling to your body that you're diminutive, that you're small, that you don't matter. And this is an ongoing, unconscious conversation that you're having with yourself. So we're going to run you through some posture exercises. And one second, we'll do a couple more. Another thing to keep in mind, when you recognize when you're in a bad mood, is a lot of what we're doing is mindfulness, is plotting the way you feel, outlining it, note taking, and then improving it. You're not going to leave here with the whole way to live your life forever. You're, you're now learned how to observe yourself, diagnose yourself, figure out what is going on, and then building on there every day. So what you'll notice is that when you're in a bad mood, you always want to look at where your posture is. Great example of that is anger. Again, you know, should, everybody should read George Lakoff's book, Metaphors We Live By. What? Metaphors We Live By. And it's about how our language has deep metaphorical structures that we don't think about. And I'll give you an example. When you're angry, people say, take a step back. Now, have you ever thought why that is? Why do they say, take, well, take a step back? What does that mean? Well, because anger is a forward moving emotion. So nobody who's angry is floating backwards, right? If you're angry, you're moving forward. So unconsciously, we get it, but you never actually examine these language structures. So a really fun exercise and activity you can do, actually, is every time somebody goes, well, take a step back, you want to think, well, what metaphor is embedded in that? And what you find out is that emotions have movement. So a big mistake people make is they try to stop being, how do I stop being angry? Well, that would be like a guy you know, coming to run after me. Well, how do, you, how do you stop it from coming? You just want to move it. If a train's on the tracks, rather than stop the train, just divert, divert the track, right? So you, you, can't always, you, can't just stop, you can't just stop anger. So how do I stop being angry? But you can immediately hijack it, that feeling, through a, a body language intervention. A real simple one is if you find yourself angry, they're like this, right? We all know what anger looks like. I could show a picture, and this has been studied by Paul Eichmann and others about reading faces. There's culturally universal expressions like anger. So everybody knows what it looks like. I could go you know, anywhere. It doesn't matter. Well, if you're angry and you feel anger, rather than say, how do I stop being angry? Why don't you just like, st step back, right? Because that's what people tell you, take a step back, but it never really meant anything. So you can actually make yourself become less angry by simply making a posture adjustment. So if you feel yourself getting angry, that's forward motion, then the way to deal with that motion is to change your posture, become more open, sit back. It won't immediately dissipate the anger, but then it hijacks the feeling because you've now changed your self-talk, because your body language is your self-talk, and it's probably the most important conversation that we all have. So then you got, again, the feedback loop. Bad posture leads to bad mood. Now, you know, what we're about to do is based on Amy Cuddy's work. She did a TED Talk, very internet famous and all that. And then a lot of people came out and said, oh, the studies were actually fake, because most social psych psychology is actually fake. I, you know, I don't want to get into all that, but it's not replicable. They've done all these studies, and they write these big books on you know, this great phenomenon. Malcolm Gladwell writes a book, and then People like five years later try to replicate the studies and they're going, no, actually, it's complete BS. Not, not true at all. So I'm not claiming this is scientific at all. But I've noticed from dealing with countless people that if you do this, it is harder to be in a bad mood. And I'll tell you why. There's vulnerability. You're expressing vulnerability when you, when you do these posture exercises. So Alejandro is going to come and he's going to help me lead this workshop up here. So he's going to come onto the stage. Alejandro, that's, that, would be, that would be you. That would be, so the, the reason we brought in Alejandro, and everybody's going to do it too, and then Alejandro and Ben is going to lead you. And this is why I had you sign the waiver. I don't think anybody's actually going to be injured for anything we do, but I don't want somebody to be like, oh my God, I stretched my arm out and you know, my tig ligament, you know, and then Soros to fund the lawsuit and everything, you know? Oh, oh my God. So, this is the stuff I got to worry about here. So what we'll do is we're going to analyze Alejandro. How do most, what's the body language most people have? What is the posture that most people have dem demonstrated, right? Hunched over, you're leaning forward, pelvic, interior pelvic tilt, right? Your hips are straight, and that's the way, and you look at the ground, right? Everybody looks at the ground. 
So even when you're driving, you should always look ahead. Yeah, right. exactly. Walking. Right. Yeah. So that that's the unconscious con- uh, 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 schlub, right? So people they walk around like schlubs all day, and then they're like, "Well, why am I getting what I want out of life?" Like, because that's what the world looks at you at. Right? You walk around like that, and it's like, well, that you're getting everything that you deserve out of life because that's a, it's a conversation. Yeah, you're you're having. So then, yeah, I I posture. I posture is another one, which you know I'm just as bad. I foam roll a lot, but you know I posture is, and I didn't make that term up. Somebody else did, but I posture is you sit like this all day, and your neck kinks. And I've took some really good pictures of that over the years. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to not do it. We call this sort of like the abundance posture pose. And the reason we do it is because you're immediately signaling unconsciously to your own body and to your own mind of one of openness and abundance. So the, the, the way you want to do it is you want to deconstruct it again. We're going to show you, and then we're going to lead everybody through it. So Ben's going to help, and Nessa's going to help because he's, you know, he's been to this part, and Scott's going to help you guys too. So if you turn around, uh, look over your shoulder. Miles can help too. So Scott, Miles... Nestor, you know, they've been here before. Uh, Ben's over there. They can, they can kind of lead you through it. So the way you want it, the way you want to deconstruct it is uh, step by step. And a lot of you might feel like you're going to fall over initially when you do it, but you won't actually fall over. But it'll, it'll feel unbalanced because most people have never actually opened themselves up. So the, the first thing that you want to do is you want to correct your hips. So if, if Alejandro is standing like this and, he, and he's hunched forward, you want to open your hips up and bring your hips in. And a way that's helpful to actually do that is kind of put your hands on your own hips and flip it almost like you're moving a knob or a switch. Because most people, so you see how, see how is, he's like that, right? Most, most people, that's how you are. So unconsciously, you want to just flip it a little bit. Are you tucking? Well, I mean, you got to watch. Yeah, that's... And that's why, people, that's why people will help you through that. So step one is you know, groundedness with, with your feet. And then you want to just bring your, bring your chest up as, as if you're trying to lean back. And when you do that, it initially probably hurt a little bit. Because most people, myself included, if you do work at a desk, it feels unnatural. And your abdominal muscles are probably tight and constricted. You might have something that feels like an ab cramp. So first you start like this. And then you lift yourself up here by the chest, right? And then you rise yourself up. And then you outstretch your arms as if you're about to lean back and fall into a swimming pool. And then, right, and that's one repetition. And then do that again. That's another repetition. Right? Now, don't lean as far back as he is if you're new to this, because I don't want anybody <laughs> falling back, but you did sign a waiver. So I, I don't, it's, on, it's on you, whatever happens. But you will feel a little bit off balance, and that's natural, because you're going against the... Um, the flow or the natural state, which is kind of a slug. I mean, if you really think about it, again, it goes back to my, you know, my fundamental view on the human condition, which is that we're just kind of slugs, and we're not particularly good, good people unless you really work on it. We wanted to do that before the workshop, but as you can see, you feel better, right? You feel more open. You feel loose. You're more checked in your body. You're more present. You, you always want to examine your posture throughout the day, and that's just one exercise you can do. Gorilla Mindset, which I imagine everybody has already. There's a bunch of exercises in there for specific issues. And then foam rolling and everything can't be. I, mean, I live on a foam roller. I have a travel foam roller. When I fly anywhere, I have a travel foam roller that's hollowed out in the middle so I can throw my socks and underwear in the foam roller. You guys don't know? A foam roller. Yeah. You guys don't know? What the, next time we do a, a more long, longer one, I'll get into foam rolling. So. Remember, angry, take a step back, sad, down in the dumps. So ha- has anybody ever heard the expression, take to the bed? Take, it's, to the bed? take to the bed. It's a Victorian era expression. And the idea was, oh, the, uh, women were so, yeah, it's not, it's not exciting at all. It was the idea that Victorian women were so prim and proper that if uh, a man cussed in their presence in the salon, they would faint and they would, you know, they would take to the bed. 
because they were so overwhelmed, this actual expression. You guys are learning Victorian you know, history here too. So you know that when you're, you're getting beat up by life, which happens to everybody, you just want to lay down. That's the natural physiological response. You, you're, you feel weighed down by life, the weight of the world. I'm down in the dumps. Those are, again, the metaphorical patterns, language patterns that we all live by. That's why the great book is called Metaphors We Live By. We live by them. You don't even know it. So if you feel sad and you lay down, that's the worst thing you can do. Just sit up. Just sit up. That's sometimes all you need to not, feel, to not feel a certain way. If you're angry, sometimes all you need to do is just sit, sit back, <coughs> stretch out, do some, do some posture poses, and then you'll find out that the anger dissipates and goes away. So again, posture, it really is self-talk, right? Now does everybody, because you learn nonverbal communication within the context of persuasion, but nobody ever tells you, because everybody says, well, 80% of communication is nonverbal. I don't believe that, but a large percentage of it is. But nobody tells you that your posture is actually another form of self-talk. Your posture is another way to be more mindful. Here I am, I'm standing, I'm, I'm opening myself up, I'm opening my body up, I'm opening up um, myself to the universe. And then mindfulness again ties into self-talk. So if you do these stretches, I just say, I'm opening myself to, to the universe and all of its possibilities. Well, that's what I say. If I, because people are like, how oh, to be more creative? How do I do this? How do I do that? It's like, well, just be more open. That's all creativity is. How do you, you know, how do I come up with so many ideas all the time? Because it isn't that I'm creative, it's that I'm open to the universe and all of its possibilities. And then a lot of times you are going to invite some negative energy too, because if you open yourself up fully, then there is going to be, you are inviting negative energy in the universe, but that's, you know how to handle that. And you know with frame control that even though you're inviting negative energy, you recognize that the negative energy is a component of positive energy. A very concrete example is that, and this is why you know, the internet is what it is. I don't know, does anybody know what the makeup girls are on YouTube? Yeah. So I, I'm obsessed with the makeup girls. J just, and I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. Marketing and branding. Go to Sephora, go to Sephora, and they have makeup lines down in Sephora. So you took, there, this, uh, there's this con entirely new genre of people where they did makeup tutorials, built massive, big, global, worldwide brands, and now they have their own lines of products, and they were nobodies. Right, so people are like, oh, so I was like, so people go, oh, how do I do what you do? I go watch a bunch of makeup girls. They're like, well, that, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Even more did. Like, yeah, well, that was ironic. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, they're, um, yeah, so that's what I tell people is, just watch them. They created something out of nothing. That's alchemy. There was no such thing as a, a genre of um, entertainment or entrepreneurialism, whatever you call it, based around makeup. But somehow they created that out of nothing. Well, that's about being open to the world and all of its possibilities. If you'd have told people 10 years ago, hey, yeah, there's going to be these girls that are like oh, millionaires now. They have their own line of products in the stores, and they started off by doing YouTube videos with makeup, you would be arrested probably, right? That would be just loony. And if you tried to create that creatively, you, you couldn't even come up with it because it's such an absurd idea that it, you wouldn't even think of it in a creative process. But if you just say, well, hey, I'm opening myself up to the idea that I do something every day. All I'm doing is filming what I'm doing every day. All this magic kind of happens. That's the universe. The downside, this is why I brought up the makeup girls. I get a lot of hate, a lot of it's deserved, so I own that, I don't have a problem with that. But if you read the makeup girl comments, I, they get way worse hate than I get, <laughs> right? And I deserve it. What, what do they do, you know? What do they do? They're just trying to be nice and you know, help people cover up blemishes and stuff and, and look nicer. They're just very positive people. There's no politics there. There's, their, their comments are way nastier than anything I get. And, and that's just because when you open yourself up to a new genre, you open yourself up to the world, you're going to attract negative energy like that too, no matter what. So, you, so no matter what you do, when you open yourself up to the positive, that's always going to come with negative energy too. But you're not afraid of that now because you recognize that's frame control. Well, the only reason they have haters is because they have the, these like empires. They have the many empires. You know, the only reason I have haters is because I have influence. The only reason I have people want to write hate pieces on me is because they think I'm a powerful voice and they have to silence me or else they can't continue to lie and deceive people into to more wars that we never should have been involved with. So the deep state is hires the media to attack me because there's a lot of money in war. 
So the only reason, so that's why when the hit pieces come on me, I'm like, well, yeah, of course. Of course they want to come after me. I'm trying to stop wars, right? And that's what they, that's what they want. So you, you're, in, you're inviting that and you're reframing that kind of negative energy into positive. And then vision is putting it all together. Aligning habits with vision and then manifesting your personal day. So what I said earlier, I go, what are you? You are the sum total of the activities you engage in and the people you spend your time with. Well, the activities you engage in are your habits. Good habits, bad habits, we all have habits. So right now, you have learned a bunch of new habits. What's one habit you learned today? I already called on you, I'll leave you alone. Uh, who haven't I, how are you doing, Miles? All good to see you. What's one habit you've learned today, Miles? Attack 10 when they hit you with one. Exactly, there you go. So new, how will you use that in your life? Exactly. 8C, what, what's a habit that you've learned today that when you leave, there's one thing that you can do differently? There you go. See? Habits and vision. So everybody here is going to leave with some specific habits, and they're going to be different for everybody. So for me, my habit is, and it shows in my work product, you know, not everything I do is a work, right? This, I have to have a work. But there are days people are like, you look tired. I'm like, well, yeah, thanks, um, but I'm tired. Why? Because I work every day. Why do I work every day? Because you don't come relevant if you take the days off. You can't be relevant in the 24-hour news cycle the way I am if you take days off. Now, you maybe only work a half day, but you don't. There's no vacation in, in my world. So sometimes that means you show up and your hair's a little off and you know, you're, maybe you're not looking your best or maybe you're a little, it doesn't matter. If your vision, which is again back to mantra, lining it all, my vision is too big to ignore. That's why I don't care what people are saying as long as they're saying it. It doesn't matter. So if my vision is too big to ignore, then the habit to align with that vision is I have to do it every day. I have to show up every day. I have to kill it every day. And again, even though it might not always be a work, I don't say, oh, today was just a B day. I figure, okay, but you showed up every day. And then you're better at it. And the truth is that I didn't, when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. So people go, oh, how'd you do it? I don't know. I was at a, an event, and there was a big protest outside, and people were screaming. There were hundreds of people out there screaming at a protest. And I go, there's, n there's no media here. Why don't you just go talk to the people? So they're all yelling, and I just go, OK, there's this thing called Periscope, and I don't know how to use it. And I just went up, and I was like, hey, who, who, you know, who wants to talk to me while you're here? What bring you out here? And all of a sudden, I had like 4,000 live viewers. I, was, I, I didn't have a Mophie or any kind of charging, because I know what I was doing. My phone was dying. I was sprinting to the car. I have to recharge it, turn on the AC. I'm overheating, and then I'm sprinting back just to try to get good footage, because I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't plan it. But because I'm open to possibility, right, which goes back to earlier. I just said there's all these people. There's a protest. They're screaming. Nobody's talking to them. I'm just going to go up and talk to them on this phone using this app called Periscope. And then that created a whole new genre of it, which is kind of gonzo, uh, the modern day gonzo journalists are, you know, people you march with uh, the protesters. I marched with the Democrat protesters. I marched with CARE, I marched with everybody, and just live stream. I don't checkmate them. I don't say, oh, I'm gonna ask you a thing and then edit it and try to make you look stupid. I just say, you're live, there's 5,000 people watching. What's, what do you want people to know? Why are you here? And then that created an entire new genre now where you just, you just go to the march with them and you just hold it up. And then you, know, you can do participatory stuff. But again, that's just a habit. You have to show up where the people are. If you're home on a Saturday doing nothing, then what's your life vision? Well, maybe you don't have a life vision. So that's why these, these work in sync is that you need a life vision and then your vision has to align with your habits. And then, of course, you fold that into a day. So the way I always like to do this is, and it's, it's covered in full and gorilla mindset, but for today, we're going to do a little bit differently because there's like 10 people who have already, already been. So I'll just kind of like, Todd, what's, what's your vision here for yourself? I want to, I want to create an impact. OK. But I want there to be something left in my wake. OK, so you want a legacy. Yes. A legacy for what? for other people, like people. 
See, so this is good. It's a good start. See how vague it is, though. Right. I want to leave a, a legacy. You know, there's Jeffrey Dahmer has a legacy, right? right. <laughs> legacy is a, is a value neutral kind of term, right? Stalin has a legacy. Pol Pot has a legacy. <laughs> Mao has a legacy. But so I like what you're saying. But when you're designing your vision, this is why the reason I asked you that is because you want to think more concretely. So legacy is a very abstract term. But life is a very concrete, concrete event. So the way you do it is you line it your perfect day. Here's what I do. I wake up. I roll over. Are you next to somebody? Are you next to two people, three people? Maybe by yourself. I don't know. That's not for me to, to judge or tell people. What do you do from the minute you wake up? Who do you wake up next to? Where do you wake up? Do you hear the ocean crash? Maybe you know the, the waves crash because you're by the beach. Maybe you smell the sea. But you have to make it an immersive experience because that's how you craft your life vision. Because if you craft your life vision, then you'll know what habits you're going to need. But if you just say, well, I want to have a legacy, that isn't specific. But if you say, OK, you know, I wake up, and I'm really excited for what I do because I'm going to go to my job at a children's hospital. And I'm, I'm volunteering in a children's hospital. So I have to get in there. I usually get in there at 10 AM, and there are these kids, and they have burn, you know, burn victims. And I go talk to them and read to them, whatever, whatever, right? So now you're thinking about that, and then you have a concrete definition of your life vision by basing it around the day. And then from there, your habits are going to align. Because if your life vision is, you know what, I wake up, and I'm, I hear the waves crashing. I, you know, I hear, for me, I don't care about that anymore, but that was what got to me was I was like 19, grew up in the Midwest, and I went to visit my sister, and we went to the beach for the first time, and her in-laws had a beach house. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. The water's right there. I can hear the waves crash and, and all that. And I go, I just want that. At the time, I was 19. I didn't even know what wanting that looked like. So it turns out it's like a, a timeshare for like five grand a year. It wasn't even like anything. right? But for me, that was like a huge thing. So I didn't even know what that was, though I just knew that that is what I wanted. So I know that you're not going to get a house in the water if you're hung over on a Saturday, right? You're not going to get, what, so that's me specifically, but for you it might be different. So if you think, so for me, I, the way I would do is I said, before I started doing like the grill mindset stuff, I said, my perfect day is I wake up and I just, I work out of a coffee shop. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I can work out of a coffee shop and I'm, and I'm doing something there. And I can control my schedule. I don't have a boss, and I like the people that I work with and work for. And that, that was my vision. I, I, I talk to the people, they email me, I don't get angry because I'm, I'm glad to hear from people. I, I like the people that I meet. And then that became my vision, and then that would even dictate what I write. Because there was a time that I wrote stuff, and then people were around me, and I was like, well, I don't like these people who are around me. Right? Well, that's not part of my vision, and then, of course, I was manifesting the people that were around me through my, the energy I was sending out. So that was my own fault. But that's what I mean. If my vision is I like the people I work with, I like all of you, but then I'm you know, saying things or doing things that attract people that I don't like, then that is a misalignment between habits and vision, which is what people have. The best example of this is you know, we all know people who would be amazing in relationships. They say, they say they want a relationship, and then they're at bars till 4 in the morning, right? Well, you don't. Right? Don't tell me you do. You want that if your habits aren't aligning with your vision. And a lot of that is most people don't know they have a vision, but a lot of that too is, is accountability. You have to align your habits with your vision. So I, you know, I had a guy, I get this a lot. I don't want to pick on him and maybe he's here, but you know, he said, he messaged me, I want to create the ESPN before like Republicans or conservatives or whatever. Is that a good idea? So I clicked over his social media profile. He's not doing live streaming. He's not tweeting sports. He's not covering local games. Like, oh, he doesn't want to do anything but waste my time. Right? That's all he wants to do, waste my time, because maybe I can fill a, a void in his life that he has. Because if you tell me I want to start an ESPN, then I should be able to go to your social media right now. And you might not be getting any retweets. Maybe nobody's tweeting you out. Maybe nobody's linking your stuff. But I should be able to find 10 videos, 100 videos, a bunch of blogs. And again, maybe nobody's reading them. But people say, oh, I want to do what you do, Cernovich. And I'm like, well, anybody can do what I do. But having an audience is a different thing. But you don't build the audience until you do all the, the grinding for a year. So then you would ask yourself, well, if I claim that I want to be a whatever, 
then are, are your habits aligned with that supposed vision? And to align your vision, you have to, of course, create your perfect day. It has to be concrete, specific. You have to see it. You have to own it. And then you have to brainwash yourself that it's possible. I had a vision that I wanted to sell a lot of books. I didn't know how to do it. But if you have a vision, I want to sell a lot of books, then unconsciously, you're going to go read books on how to sell books. Right? That's what people don't miss is if, if in your own head you say, I want to do this, and then earlier the first question, the most highlighted passage, am I in the moment becoming the person I want to be? So if I say, I want to sell a lot of books or whatever your goal is, if you say, I want to make a lot of money, then I'm saying, well, if you want to make a lot of money, you need to be in venture capital, sales, or finance. If you really want to make you know, a lot of money, that's where you make the money. So then you would be reading books on sales, going to, to public speaking events. You would be maybe networking with venture capitalists or trying to start a dot com or something. If you want to make real, real money, I'm not talking like my money, but you know, real, real money, then that's what you would be doing. And it would all become unconscious. So when people tell me, well, I want to have a podcast, I'm like, OK, well, where are your podcasts? Right? You can't do one? Oh, well, nobody listened to it. But how, nobody listened to mine, right? Nobody's listened to my early podcast. I've got 100 listens, and I was, but I was like hot stuff, right? Now if I did a video with like 100 live viewers, I would delete it. I'd feel demoralized, <laughs> right? So you, you ask yourself constantly, you check in, well, if I say I want this, am I doing something right now that's going to bring me what I want? And then you align your habits and your vision. Yes, David. Yeah, my question is um, for you, or, or how long should we embrace the suck or you know, for playing to the empty room? Depends on what you want to do. Uh, the way I, there's, a, there's a right answer to that. In, in another one of my seminars I gave before, I always say, don't be afraid to quit. So I boxed when I was younger. I was good. Um, good, good enough. Good, right. Certainly good enough to be. Cer yeah, those guys have no idea what they would get into. They, they, uh, but, but I was good enough to get my head smashed in and be like a mid-tier journeyman kind of guy who could have been something maybe on an ESPN once or twice. So then you go, OK, so I'm, maybe I'm good enough. I can be on ESPN once or twice in my life and have headaches for the rest of my life. Maybe that's not a right choice, right? Or if you, if you, train, if you train a sport like jiu-jitsu, you think you're getting pretty good, you got the blue belt. Guy comes in, he's been doing it for three months, and he's like steamrolling you. Well, then your idea of being a BJJ world champion, you probably say, well, reality has its own vision for you. And so you, that's what I mean. Life, as Mark Twain said, isn't a dance. It's more of a wrestling match. So yeah, there are, there are th I don't tell people that they can do anything, because I don't believe that's true. I can't do anything. I couldn't be in the NBA. I never could have been a, a championship boxer or a championship UFC guy. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how many times I read Gorilla Mindset, or did, I never would have been a, a high-level boxer, high-level UFC guy. But I still enjoyed it and went along the way. And then what's going to happen is you'll find out what you're good at. And then Scott Adams, of course, in his great book, talks about this, which is, you know, passion is bull crap. There's a reason I don't say how to find your passion. If you find something you're good at, people are going to say, wow, you're really good at that. And then you're going to get reinforcement for what you're good at. And then that is going to become your passion. So, but again, you have to try. You have to get hit enough times. And you know, the flip side is you always have to know, am I quitting too soon? It's hard. It's specific. The flip side to that, too, is you want to get in a room with the real contenders. So another thing, too, is I went to Arnold Classic when I was in college. I was a big guy. You know, I was in good shape and everything. And then I went to the Arnold Classic in Columbus. It's like a big fitness comp. And you look around, and you're like, dude, I'm nothing. You know? So if I wouldn't have said, oh, I'm going to be a world pro-level bodybuilder. It's not, not going to happen. Because you go into a room like that, and you just see that you're so outclassed in every way that that isn't going to happen. So that, that comes to it. That's where you have to face your fears, like we said earlier. Challenge yourself, push yourself. Sometimes you have to go into a room where you're going to be low man on the totem pole. And then you'll get an assessment. Do these people just have some kind of X factor that I don't have? And then it becomes a judgment call. But the flip side, too, is, and this is where people, you know, this is another reframing technique, is that everything you feel at is transferable to something you're good at, right? If I, for whatever reason, couldn't do journalism anymore, I could use all these skills for, I could be a real estate, big time real estate agent tomorrow if I wanted to. Everything I know about brand building, marketing. So for whatever reason, I, I wasn't good at this. I now have you know, transferable skills, which is why Scott Adams' book is so good too, is if you can public speak. So maybe you say, I want to be the, the number one 
whatever actor in the world. And, but you learn public speaking. You learn how to feel a mode, emotional depth, how to read people, how to read a room, how to read energy. Well, maybe you, you don't become the number one actor in the world, but you now have a whole bundle of skills that you can take and you have like what he would call a talent stack. You can take that to anywhere. You, you can take it to anything. So it isn't that you failed at the endeavor because the game is never over. That's what you know, nobody tells you. Successful people, that's why I like Adams' stuff so much and why you know, even if I weren't me, I would like my stuff is we don't lie to you. Uh, become a success and now you're a success and it's great and every day I just wake up and success, success everywhere you look, right? The, the best illustration of this was uh, election night. You know, I'm right, everybody was wrong. Big party, big election party. I go home and I take the trash out, right? That's the reality. The, re the reality is it doesn't matter who you are, you're gonna take the trash out at night. You know, your wife or husband or you know, whatever is gonna say you need to spend more time. You're gonna have a dog. <laughs> You're gonna have a dog. Yeah, you're gonna have. You're gonna have a dog that gets away. So th there is no ever. There is no endpoint of success. So you you want to in anything you do. In anything you do, you want to build transferable things. So you can never go wrong being in good shape, even if you're never gonna be Kai Green or the the, the biggest body of the world. Learning how to, to to work out, physical culture, take care of your body. You can take that to anywhere in life. Now, is there a specific sort of endeavor you were looking for? General. Yeah, that, that's the general answer, but do things that are going to allow you to carry over those skills into other activities and endeavors. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. All right, I'm in a transition Yes. Period, so I'm kind of figuring it out, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice or on, on to focus in on what the next well, the, the fine transition, transitioning from where to where? From what I was doing prior okay. to figuring out what I want to do now. But it's going to be in the same realm, like design or something. But I, I, I'm just... Yeah, so transitioning, transitioning is one of those scary words that we talked about earlier, like a contraction. I think transition is a scary word to use. Okay. Because we're always, tra we're always transitioning, right? Yeah. So we, we, we think, well, I'm going to transition phase... Well, what do you do when you're, it's called living life and you're moving towards your life vision. So rather than, say, rather than saying I'm in a transition phase and you're looking at this phase, you're thinking about your life vision and then you're asking yourself, am I doing what it takes to, to work towards my life vision? And then you won't know you're in a transition phase until you pass it. So what if you're not sure what your life vision is then? Well, the, the perfect day you have to decide how you want to wake up. Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? And you won't know that that's the soul searching. That's why I can't give anybody the answers for themselves. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's why the perfect day is how you find your life vision. Is, you know, where do you want to wake up? Uh, you know, does a person say, you yeah, know, I want to wake up, I'm hard of hearing, I have Cheetos on my face, I'm watching the news waiting to die? Right? A lot of people end up there. Right? I mean, tens of millions of people, that's, that's where they end up. But I think if you said, is that where I want my life vision to be? Most people say, well, that's crazy. Well, a lot of people end up there. And that's because they never took the time early on in their life to figure out, okay, that's, that's where I'm going to end up. That isn't where I want to be. I want to focus on a life vision and clearly define it. It takes time, years. This stuff, I mean, this stuff, I, you know, I wrote the book. I still live it. But not perfect. You, you do reach a phase where then life intercedes. I have a daughter now. How's my life vision work with my daughter? You know, I go from kind of a hedonistic, sort of selfish person to, okay, well, now I, I have to be more attentive. We've got a daughter, we got a, you know, Shauna, his wife, you know, we've got stuff going on. So you have, to, you have to work through that, and it's never over. The game, the game is never over. So all of life is a transition period. I never thought I'd be in the field I'm in, doing the stuff I'm doing. That was never on my goal board. I just said that I always wanted to have an impact on the world. And then another tip, too, is don't over-psychoanalyze because there's a lot of people obsessed with like psychoanalysis. Well, why is it that you want to do that? Perhaps you didn't get enough attention as a child and everything. It doesn't work. Empirically, it doesn't work. It's been proven that analyzing your motivations and why do you really want it, it almost never works. You have to just say, this is what I want to do. I'm going to work towards it. And then you keep working towards it. Yes, Israel. Sort of 
Yes, and I, I'm, not, I'm not ignoring you. I actually have that line in Guerrilla Mindset. It's actually covered because most people want permission. Most people think they need to have permission because of social constructs. So what I actually have early on in the book is you have permission, the tools you need to succeed. And then the way I frame it is I go, when is the last time someone sat next to you and asked you your hope and dreams? Right? You always hear about duty, what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to want. But when has somebody actually said, hey, what do you want? What do you want out of life? How can I help you get what you want out of life? Almost nobody. Well, when's the last time you sat down with yourself and said, what do I want? Now, as long as it's not illegal or something, you know, truly sociopathic or whatever, then, uh, you know, I live a certain way that people find well, appalling, right? I know what people say. I don't care. That's what they don't understand is I go, your moral judgment doesn't mean anything to me. You're, you're judging me and you're trying to take some kind of moral high ground. I just don't care. I don't need your permission to live the way that I want to live my life. That's something you have to reach with yourself. And then, of course, you have to use the mindset tools because people will shame you. If you're living the way the herd doesn't want you to live or the hive mind doesn't want you to live, then they're going to shame you and then you have to unwrap those feelings and why, why do you feel shame? Well, you feel shame because you're brainwashed at some point in your life that you're supposed to live a certain way. And then you deconstruct that feeling and then you realize that, well, wait a minute, shouldn't they be, here's the way I always put it, shouldn't they be ashamed that they're shaming me for not doing what I want them to do? <laughs> Right? That sounds like bullshit to me. Like when people, would, I would often hear this, you're selfish. Well, why? Because I won't do what you want me to do? That's what makes me selfish? How about you? You're the selfish person. You're twice as selfish because you want to control me. All I want to do is be let alone. So once you really realize that these emotions like shame and guilt aren't yours, you didn't come up with it. You didn't come up with the rules. You weren't Moses and you went up to Mount Sinai and then God came and you had divine revelation and... Right? You were given those bullshit rules by somebody else, and they don't follow them. How many people talk about global warming from their yachts, private jets? Right? People, you know, I know a lot of, whether or not, whether or not a person thinks global warming is man-made or not, I don't, you know, people believe what they believe. I'm not going to argue that. But if you're flying private jet to your yacht to talk to me about global warming and I need to turn on the thermostat, I'm not particularly interested in hearing what you have to say. So the people who give me these rules, the rules are usually bullshit, they don't even follow them, so then why, why would you follow them? And then of course that gets into like slave morality, the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow rules given, me, given to me by the masters, but they don't even follow their own rules, then you realize you're a slave. And then you have to decide, is your life vision consistent with being a slave to the motivations, the expectations, and the entitlement of other people? Because there's so much of that. People feel entitled to how you should feel and what you should do. And if you say what you want to do, and it happens, you know, even my friends do stuff that I don't like. You know, the flip side, like I don't care if somebody wears a hijab, but it's none of my business. Why do people feel entitled to be upset by how other people dress or what religions they practice? Right? Well, that's an entitlement that that person is doing something that I don't like. What, what, what's that to you? So, and I'm the same way when other people dress. Well, I don't like the way you, you know, talk to people or whatever. I don't care. You, you, don't, you don't have that kind of moral authority. So you have to ask yourself whether there's anybody alive today, myself included, who has moral authority to tell anybody else how to live. I sure don't have it. Hillary Clinton doesn't have it. Trump doesn't have it. I don't think there's anybody, any public figure that I've seen, uh, maybe Elon Musk is a pretty good guy, it seems like. You know, maybe Charles Munger. Maybe there's a couple people, but the point is, who has moral authority to tell you how to live? Look around. Nobody. So you have to live how you want to live. No, it's better to not be public about your vision. For for a number. Well, let's. Yeah, for for me, I'm very public. Yeah, yeah. It's a diff, it takes a long time to get here to where to where I am. Yeah, but I'm not. Um, but I'm not really truly public about my end game. Nobody knows my real end game, right? I hint at it from here or there, but yeah, nobody actually knows. Nobody knows my real end game or what, you know, what I'm actually really up to, and, and nobody will. Yeah, even without the camera, I'm not gonna tell you guys. Maybe somebody has a microphone. It isn't like an evil, it, it's not like an evil end game, but, uh, you know, but no, I'm not gonna tell anybody my end game. It's, it's better, it's better. I definitely do not wanna be president. I definitely do not, I wouldn't want to be president. So 
the thing with your vision is you have to have it for yourself. And it doesn't limit your effectiveness if it's public or if it's private. The, what, so if you, let's say, for example, you shared your vision with your friends. Some of them are going to hate on you. Well, that's good to have. Get rid of them. Cut, cut them out right away. Like I had a guy the other day, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to start a super PAC. And he goes, well, be careful. You know, people come after you for the super PAC. And I just go, okay, I don't, I'll never talk to this person again. But, <laughs> like, I don't know. You know. I don't know. I have a target on my back every day of my life. I don't know that people aren't looking to catch me slipping up with a paperwork thing or something, so I won't have a, a lawyer to, to make sure you know, things are good to go. But, but that's that person's first thought was, well, let me tell you why that's a bad idea. Even though like, I, think, I think I have it under control. So if you share your vision, you're going to get hate. But then, of course, if you share your vision, you get people who get bought into your vision, which we're going to move in. I'll take a couple more questions, move in the next segment, which is you know, charisma and connection. Because a lot of, a lot of people, I've, I've never taught this stuff publicly before, because the world wasn't ready until you have a growth mindset. Because if you don't have a vision for your own life, how do you create a shared vision for people? You don't even know what you want to do with your life, but how do you get buy-in from people? That's what always cracks me up when the media people try to cover what I do is, they don't realize, they think I just lead this thing and I don't. I go, you have to get buy-in from people. People have their own needs, desires, expectations that they're going to push back. But I have to have a vision first in order to have sort of a shared vision with the world. And then that's where charisma comes in and, and connection, how to specifically make that happen. But before we flip over and have Ben, Ben's going to help me with that, uh, take a couple more questions. Uh, actually, I actually have two questions, but if you can only answer one. One. Okay. Uh, my first question is about the military. Yes. So I'm thinking about joining the military and kind of like you were saying, kind of how I feel. Uh, there's a lot of unnecessary wars going on, so I'm kind of battling with that in my head. That, like, I want to be able to feel like my patriots are looking towards the flag, and at the same time, I don't want to go into an unnecessary war. Well, once, you, once you're in, you don't have any control over what happens next. That's for sure. So, yeah, I get that question a lot. A lot of people want to join the military. Whenever it's a man who's asking me that question, because I'm pro joining the military. Yeah. I was in for nine years, you know, got the DD-214 and everything. I'm pro. But nine times out of ten, when a man asks me that question, he's really saying, my life is lacking adventure and spirit, and I want more adventure and spirit in my life. So, well, I'm not saying that's the case with you, but I'm saying, you know, because that, that question comes up, and then other people say, well, you know, it's patriotism, whatever. So you want to find the root reason that you want to do that. And then you should spend a lot of time reading internet message boards on what military life is really like. Wake up at five in the morning, go clean your house, shave, wait for formation, stand around and do nothing, go do PT, go wait, go have breakfast, stand around and do nothing for another, that's what most of life is, is standing around doing nothing. It, it isn't what people think it is. Active duty, unless you're with like a, you know, a special operations unit is, for the most part, tedium. You're around early, you're standing around doing nothing, you're with, you know, you're not 19, are you? No. You're gonna be with 19-year-olds, never been drunk before, never been away from home, chugging beers, you know, which might be fun, but for me, that's not my, that's the reality, barracks life. Are you married? No. So you'd be living in the barracks, 18 or 19-year-olds, beer everywhere, ever. yeah. so that's the thing is, Make sure you have a realistic idea of what the military is and army life is like or marine life or whatever life is really like versus the glamorous image that we have of, of what it's like. Because they're definitely two different things. Yes? Uh, can you talk about um, maybe a little different situation? So grow, 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 get out everything I want, and then kind of plateau because the vision that I had had reached. And so now it's kind of like, I'm going to just transition. What do I do? Do I just kind of keep plateauing? See, that's the word transition again, right? It, it comes up. Yeah, that's the, whole, that's the whole point is that, you know, we talked about earlier, you get everything, I've got everything I wanted, right? That's what people think, oh, what happens? I go, I, I can't believe I live this life. So what do you do? How do you keep pushing yourselves into something else? And the answer is that if you're, if you're doing well in life, it's okay. There's no, there's no hurry to have to find a vision tomorrow. You meditate on it. It might take you two, three, four, five, six, seven months. And in fact, you know, people like Miles will tell you, the current life that I'm living now is actually um, not what I wanted 18 months ago, two months ago. Where I am now, I didn't want, even want to be. I, I actually resisted it because I thought, well, it's a waste of time. It wasn't matter and everything. And then I would kind of step in and then I would step out and I'd kind of flip it both ways. And then now I think, oh, wow, this is great. So at the time, I was in a transition period, but I didn't even know it. So the idea is that 
when you're in a transition period, you don't want to focus on how this is a transition period. You want to get to the next stage and then focus on how, then you focus, then you reflect, and then you think, of where, think about where you were. It's a good problem to have, though. And, and a lot of people, I deal with a lot of high achievement people. Usually the best answer to that is you want to challenge yourself in an unrelated realm. So if you've made a bunch of money, that's why they all go triathlons. Why, why is the average age of a triathlete 37? Well, because they're like, well, I did the business thing, I've been successful, and I'm going to push myself into a triathlon. There's a reason for that. And a lot of things that are cliche aren't really cliche. It's just a smart way to live. Like, oh, OK, I did it. I, I did the money thing. I did the, the whatever, the party thing. Now I'm going to do something completely unrelated to that. And then you're in a new area, and then you become a beginner in a new kind of subject. So I was new to kind of journalism. Didn't really know anything about it. And that was fun. It was like a new challenge. And then I had to kind of figure it out. And then you realize the same thing you know, the same stuff you knew from your other area of life, flips over to new areas of life. So that's the thing, is find something completely unrelated and then learn from there. Right behind you. Why did you call it gorilla mindset with an O instead of you? I always say Harambe not Shay, right? <laughs> and the answer is that there's actually a lot of unconscious stuff going on here. So if you notice, you know, because I, I listen to the haters, I listen to Chapo, Trap Houses, and all those guys. And you know, I think it's hilarious. So like, oh, gorilla mindset, big gorilla, and there's actually nothing about that. I always tell, just come to a seminar. There's no alpha male bullshit in any of this kind of stuff. But unconsciously, the idea of a gorilla is, or, the, or the literal, they'll treat it literally. Well, a gorilla is actually an unintelligent animal, so what you're really trying to do is teach people to not be intelligent. Well, gorillas unconsciously is a strong animal. People want to have a strong mind. So then you have the little gears with a gorilla, and then it, it's an unconscious persuasion method. Even the colors, there's actually, I could do a whole thing on cognitive psychology of color. There's a teaching course on that, actually, the cognitive psychology of color. So the colors are actually specifically designed based on, based on um, how people react to colors. So if you look at there's like a light blue, that's like a cooler kind of color, but then there's the bright red and black, which are very aggressive colors. So you're, you're creating through the colors of font a sort of balance between hot and cold. And then unconsciously, you think, well, I want to have a balanced mind, but I want to have a strong mind, but I want to be intelligent too. So there's, no, there's nothing to do with gorillas that has, you know, my editor was like going crazy. He was like, Mike, you still haven't explained why you call it a gorilla mindset. I go, it's unconscious, man. It's, it's unconscious persuasion. And, and there's actually a lot of science that went into that. Well, you either get it or you, well, it depends on how literal you are. So some people are more like literal thinkers. It's just a different mode of thinking. So if you're a literal thinker, you're like, well, why would you? It should actually be gorilla because it's like an unconventional mindset, right? And because gorillas are kind of dumb. So if you, if you view the world through that like literalism, then it doesn't make any sense at all. But if you view the world sort of more metaphorically or visually, then right away, like, oh, I mean, who wouldn't want to, who wouldn't want to have a stronger mindset? But, that, but, but it's making unconscious connections. Because nobody should want to think like a gorilla, right? Whoa. Literally, that would be. I never thought of it that way. Of course. It crossed my mind. Exactly. Because that's your way of dealing with the world. This is more maybe figurative and metaphorical and unconscious rather than. I mean, I thought it was brilliant. Rather than literal. The first time I heard it, I'm like, what a name. That's perfect. Per exactly. I'm glad you, that's why I did so well. Marketing. Mike, earlier you said learn how you can gain power by giving the other person power. Can yes. you say a little more about that? Yeah, that's the next segment, actually, of the, of the whole seminar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that, there's a good segue. OK, Nestor. Nestor's the original. Yeah. Um, you were saying that when people give out the electricity, you get a lot of negative feedback. Yes. How do you know if it's negative or is it positive? Because a lot of times people give me their electricity and I say, you better be very careful with it. I don't mean it to be negative. I actually want them to be careful with that. How can you tell them? People are going to. Life's going to hit them anyway. That, that's the way I look at it is your delusions about the world are, if you're actually living life, you're going to be smashed in the head so hard that whatever delusions you have about the world are going to be confronted with you. So as a friend, your job is not to warn people of anything other than serious pitfalls, right? If there's like a, a guy's going to be in a bad relationship with like a, somebody, then that's the kind of thing that matters. But for the most part, you know, most people are like, oh, you know, I'm going to start this business. I'm going to make $10 million. No, they're not. Right, they're not. But if a friend of mine says, I'm going to start this new business, I'm going to get $10 million out of this business, that's awesome, dude. Like, I, I encourage you, you know, have you read this book? You know, have you, there's this great blog out there. Charlie Munger's great, you should think like that. That's what, 
But he's, it's not going to happen. 90% failure rate. But let reality, let reality be his check. As a friend, you want to guide them in a way that's helpful. Because you got to realize, we all get so much negative feedback from the world that your job as a friend is to give positive feedback. Which, again, there are exceptions. If it's like legitimately a, a nasty, you know, risk where there's a really serious downside. Like if your friend says, I'm going to build a $10 million company, and to do that, I'm going to mortgage my house. Well, think that one through. Yes, yeah, Shauna. Oh, Josh. Josh. Oh, I was just going to say, um, the, the thing I've noticed lately with friends is figuring out if real friends will kind of ask you more about your vision if mm -hmm. you're not fully, you don't fully know what your vision is. And my wife like doesn't get my vision, and I'm still figuring it out. So she um, just will ask me questions. And it's like, and my one of my best friends does the same thing. And he called me the other day. He's like, dude, I think I get your vision. He's like, I've been doing this, and I've been reading this stuff. And he's like, I think I get it. And I'm like, what is it? But like, but having people that are asking you questions instead of just trying to tell you how impossible it is or how all these obstacles is, is such a good ally to have. Um, wait, one question for Sean I have to take. Shauna. Shauna, you had a question. Oh, it's time to segue? Yeah. Time to segue to charisma? Okay. So you, you, you heard it from Sean on charisma. So shared vision, giving power to other people, right? So we're going to talk about charisma. Ben's going to teach most of this. I'm going to bring him up to kind of cover it because he has a different perspective than I do. But one of the, you know, I don't, I don't like to plagiarize people, so I don't name drop to show people I'm learned or whatever. I just, I, it grates on me when people steal my stuff and like, I know you stole that. I know you took that from me. So if that bothers me, then I try to not be the person doing it to others. But their charisma without empathy is fear, right? People are afraid. That's why so many people are afraid of Trump. If you want to get down to whatever your politics are, the visceral, the visceral fear is that there's charisma without showing enough empathy to other people, to maybe people you disagree with. And that would be one of his fundamental things that he could do. Not right now, but yeah, we'll take. That would be one of the fundamental things that you know, he could do that could improve himself is if you have power, if you have power, you have to show empathy. If you have power, you have to show share vision. Otherwise, people will be afraid of you. And if people are afraid of you, then it's hard to kind of steer a guided mass movement. And the, the way, I, I mean, there's so many different contexts of it is the way people think of charisma is, you know, people think of who's charismatic, right? Bill Clinton. Even if you didn't like him, he's a charismatic guy. I don't care what your politics are. People would meet him and they would say, they're going to go into his office and they were going to just light him up. And then they go, I, I left the office five minutes and I was so pissed off I didn't even bring up what I went in there to talk about, right? Because he, he opened himself into his world. He had that power, but he guided it with the human connection because if you feel like people care about you and are concerned with where you're going, you're going to let them lead you, right? You, you have, but you have to have a shared vision. So with people who believe you want to take them somewhere, but maybe they're not willing to go, or maybe they don't think you have their best interests in mind, you're less likely, you're less likely to get what you want out of the deal, right? You're less likely to have a charisma to close the sale. And that covers everything from you know, business, sales, persuasion. Like, do people here, for the most part, feel like I care what happens to you, right? But yeah, for, for the most part, I mean, you're, you know, you're thinking, Mike cares, he, he's got me on. So if I ask you to do something a little wild, which I'm not going to do, there's a certain trust there that wouldn't exist if I just came in and started screaming at you and talked about how great I was and that you're all lucky to be in my presence and, and how dare you, right? Th then I would, there'd be no persuasion. And all of life is ultimately influenced persuasion. Everywhere you look at it, life is influenced persuasion. You're persuading people not just to sell, but you know, if, you're if you're walking down the street, there's an unconscious conversation going on right now. There's a flow of people. Have you ever just watched people move around? Well, that's unconscious, but that's persuasion in action. People are being moved, moved and guided, and that's because you know, the hive mind that we're all part of the collective consciousness, so people kind of move and flow. And then if you want to be a charismatic person for whatever reason, you have to learn how to tap into that energy and then how to redirect it into a certain way. And of course, you can't move things too far either way too, and that's what you learn is they're going to push back. So just to go to the question we had earlier is, you know, from uh, David, I think, you know, what about when life hits you back or whatever? Well, yeah, you have to get that feedback because you're plugged in too. We're all connected into the same flow or source, whatever people want to call. 
So to talk about charisma, you know, we do like to do things a little bit differently. So a friend of mine, Ben, the reason we're friends is that because he has a different source of power than I have. My source of power would be a more kind of like direct. I can be very militant and rigid and aggressive, and that's one kind of flow of power, and you sort of see it in how I live, but that's not the only source there. There's actually immense power in other perspectives. So the reason I met Ben was I was out and about talking to somebody at a bar, and then I had to go meet a girl at another bar. And I walked to the other bar with this guy that I had met, and the girl said, Ben, oh my God, it's so great to see you. And then she looked at me and said, well, how did you know Ben? I said, we just met at a bar. And the girl was Shauna, who knew Ben. And I met Ben completely independent of knowing Shauna. So th that was a kind of like synchronicity that tells you that you're, you're plugged into something that maybe a lot of people don't really understand. And Ben, the reason I knew Ben is he's very open, expressive, welcoming, has a lot of interesting things to say. So that's why right now for this part, we're going to have Ben here come and talk about charisma. You have, not hopefully you do, you have a lot of things you can take away from this and that you can practice. And that is what he said, which was so important, is the work, this is not the work. This is the warm-up. This is a few tips, a few tactics you can take, and then you're going to have to do this for 10 years. But you'll get better at it in a day. You'll get better at it in a month. This is a whole lifelong process. The, the game do, doesn't end.